what is a philosopher and philosophy and politics. And then next mm -hmm. week, we would go through a very rigorous, you know, uh, reading of the uh, of, of chapter six, half of chapter six of Plato, and also chapter seven, which is the famous allegory of the cave. And right. we'll go through the movement of ideation to, um, you know, the theory of forms, levels of abstraction, and then also from the mathematical to the uh, idea of the dialectic. And, and um, you know, this is um, uh, Badiou's major thing that he wants to, um, wants to move into a mathematical ontology. So this is on the, on the website. I just put it down for the next two weeks. And then after that, we can go into the lesser parts, you know, chapters eight and nine, and, and Badiou will go through systems of government. That'll be pretty easy for us. But then we'll come full circle around back to justice and its relationship to happiness, what that can mean for us go, going forward. I'd like to do the cave in terms of the left, like Badiou does, too. You know, it'd kind hmm. of be interesting to look at the, the cave through what is the left at, at this point, you know, um, you know where, where, where are we? Um, so, um, yeah, hopefully that'll go back. Uh, and, and for those of you interested, I, I will send you, um, uh, when it's available, um, uh, I did a very good, um, television thing on the work of Aronowitz's labor ontology today with Manny mm. Ness, and, uh, I'll send it to you, uh, once it's, uh, I think it's going to be on cable Manhattan, um, in about, uh, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. I won't get a copy because it's pre-recorded until you know it hits the cable. But in another maybe ten days, I should have cool. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was good. It was a good, good speaking about false promises all the way up to the current work on the death and life of the American American labor. <laughs> so yeah, we, and and Manny was good. You know, we we of course were uh, on target about the National Labor Relations Act and labor peace and all of that so yeah it was a lot of fun to do this and, yeah so um okay so um yeah i i, I thought you know uh, tonight we would go over the uh the chapters i mean i know last week we were talking about women children and um um you know the, and the relationship to the state i, I want to say you know for marx the notion of philosophy the way he used it you know you know the famous uh, thesis on Forbach. Thesis Ooh. 11, right, which was a yeah. publication that came out of uh, Australia, actually. <laughs> and um, um, uh, Thesis 11, of course, says, hitherto, comma, philosophers have only interpreted the world, semicolon, the point, oh, however, the point is, the point is, comma, however, <laughs> is to transform it, <laughs> right? And he uses the verb transform, change has always been it, but yes, transform it. Uh, and this was, you know, Marx's kind of beginning of the settling of accounts with philosophy up until his time, you know, and, um, you know, the, the 11th thesis has been taken up by many people as what is philosophical activity? Is philosophy dead? You know, uh, what, what does it mean about change? The other, the other thing he mentions that's kind of maybe important in this chapter is philosophy is the head of the revolution. And mm -hmm. the, the proletariat is the heart. He used this this metaphor as well, the head and the heart, uh, too. That you know, philosophy is the head of the revolution. The proletariat, the heart, of course, the question of agency, which is again our our question for today. You know, what is agency? And I know uh, Eloy, who's here, there's much more agency in Latin America <laughs> right now mm -hmm. than there is in in the uh, in the global uh, north here right in many ways uh, you know uh, so i mean good victories in um, in bolivia and uh, chile with the constitution so yeah. this, these are two small you know small moments but not really spoken about that much and and in venezuela you know even though maduro you know is, is not great he's holding on to the project if you will yeah in some ways, a lot of problems, but still holding on to the project. The other other side is atrocious, as we know. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, you want to speak to that, Eloy, before we go on, because this is a, a positive, I guess, in terms of yeah. news. Uh, yeah. Well, probably just uh, just to share my impressions of the text. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my background, my background from Latin American perspective. I uh, this idea that is uh, is mentioned that politics that don't speak to 
philosophy are not, I remember, I don't remember, uh, real politics, something like that. And uh, that divorce between theory and praxis or, or thought right. and action, I found it more on the left in North America when I came here. Oh, you that, did? Uh, that, yeah. in, that, in, that, mm-hmm. that in Latin America. In Latin America, um, action is always... The storm is in New Orleans, not in Montreal. <laughs> Right. So you're okay, uh, Eloy? Yeah. 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 And, Sorry, uh, we, we, we lost you for a second. Yeah, what was that? So that caught my attention. It, it, it. Sorry? What? I'm sorry, Hello? I couldn't hear we, what you we, said. We lost you for a second. Ah, it, okay. It okay. Like I'm, so, I'm sorry. In the, uh, I, in the fish tank. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, what I, I was uh, trying to say that it caught my attention very much in, in this chapter. When Badius uh, discusses uh, or says that uh, politics that doesn't speak to philosophy are not real doing politics, mm. that always uh, action has to be connected with an idea uh, of emancipation or an idea. And what I say that my impression with that is that when I I have this background of I am from Mexico, I was raised in Mexico, but I have been here for a while as well. Eh? in Canada, and I spent a little bit in, 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 in the United States. And, and I found that in North America, particularly here in Canada and the United States, I find more this connection between uh, praxis and theory that, that I found in Mexico. In fact, in Mexico, uh, we don't conceive uh, uh, political action without having background, theoretical, theoretical background. And there, there is something that I heard with uh, with Maestro Stanley, Stanley Haranowitz uh, last fall. He said that uh, there is a, a, a very strong um, uh, anti-intellectualism in the left now today. Right. He was referring to the an American left. Right. And, 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 and I totally I felt that. I, I, I learned that very soon when I arrived here. You know, right. the, even right. here in Montreal, I do a lot right. of work in Montreal, you know, they have this French uh, tradition and they like philosophy a lot, but Quite often, you you hear uh, that uh, people dismiss uh, the any attempt to think just yeah. for the sake of thinking and, and, and do make connection. So it, it caught my uh, attention very much. I enjoyed very much this this chapter about what it is a philosopher. Eh? Okay. Because of that uh, theory and action. Yeah, Good. that's all. What I want. Okay. No. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Some other people. I mean, I, I think that one way we can frame it and this can go, be going on for a long time, is that, you know, in some ways, Badiou's um, uh, approach to the um, political community here is really about um, the, um, um, you know, in some ways, Socrates is put on trial by the sophistic state, by the, by the sophists in some ways. This is a Badiou notion, right? That in some ways, Badiou is, again, through this, working on the on the what is the philosopher trying to define the philosopher his role etc is trying to to say that there really is a distinction between the philosopher and the sophist uh in 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 many ways both in the figure of socrates of course and uh this is a long debate in contemporary philosophy as bruno knows very well etc um you know but you is also i mean in some ways you know, the political community here, again, wants to separate out the sophistry in the name of truth procedures. You know, this is his attempt to look at postmodernism, if you will, as a group of sophistries run amok. You know, he has three <laughs> three or four, three or four, you know, uh, tendencies in the, here in terms of um, uh, the predominant uh, tendencies of our modern period. One, of course, is hermeneutics. The hermeneutical circle that has many, many levels, you know, in terms of the way it's been appropriated. There's a radical hermeneutics, the Heideggerian hermeneutics that comes out of Schleimacher, which is, you know, onto theological, if you will. Um, the, the hermeneutics that's used even by a Jameson, a Marxist hermeneutics, as interpretation, and it's really circular in in construction. And Badiou is, is, is fighting that in his way. I mean, I want to just point these things out. The other thing is the analytic, you know, 
where concept, uh, whose concept is really about the rule of language. And they all of these tendencies share one common denominator of which Badiou is going to, you know, maybe argue with and, and work with, but also argue against, which is language, capitalized, right? So hermeneutics, which interprets language, and there's a circularity in that interpretation. Secondly, the analytic philosophers, where the concept, uh, you know, whose concept is really the rule of language. You know, you're looking at syntactical structures. You're looking at, you know, uh, you know, Chomsky could be even part of that too, as part of that, that tradition, if you will, the Cartesian linguistics and these kind of codes. And then, of course, the uh, postmodern tendency, which is the, the deconstruction of totalities in favor of the diverse and the multiple, of which in some ways, you know, identity politics has grabbed hold mm. of. It may have been very, very different in terms of the intention of deconstruction is first used by Marx, by the way, Abau, which yeah. is the German term means to unbuild, Abau, you know, to unbuild something. And this is used by Marx then by Husserl actively, and then of course Heidegger in the phenomenological de destruction, and then of course taking it up, deconstru deconstruction by, by Derrida later. So Derrida is kind of fourth on the scene here, if you want to do a, a gallery of philosophers. <laughs> Marx is the first to use Abau to unbuild, right? And, and, and yeah, in a way. So he's the proto, you know, quote, deconstructionist, but not the way it, it moves in this kind of postmodernist uh, tendency. So Badiou is, is arguing against these tendencies too. He's trying to, you know, um, confront that. I mean, I'm, I, again, I'm trying to situate him here uh, to think. So what, what, what's shared in these tendencies, of course, is language is the transcendental of our time, you know? But for, Ma, for, for Badiou, it's the, the, the being as the multiple, if you will, always falls under mathematics as ontology. And we're going to see this, I hope. I mean, I don't know if we're going to agree with it, but we'll see this in terms of his reading of Book 7 of the Republic, right? And the divided line and how the forms and levels of abstractions are generated. So we're going to have to keep that as, as, as my, in, in mind, right? So what happens in all of this is that, you know, the hermeneuticians, right? The, the analytical philosophers, the postmodern philosophers are sort of regulated to places, right? <laughs> In the new political community, as you probably picked up, he's trying to propose, if you will, or project a new communism, right? He's really, really trying to do this here. It's the idea of communism that's happening. It's not, it's not uh, you know, just a hypothesis, it's an idea that's going to be played out. And you can hear this in the discussion between um, Amatha, Socrates, and Glaucon in particular throughout, throughout this chapter. What is philosophy? And then, of course, philosophy and politics. And, and one, one section, I mean, I'll just give you one page, you know, that we can maybe see um, this at work. Um, he does say um, at the end, uh, the the definite on, on politics, he does say that it really is ultimately um, our prospect project is the best one because we're in the process of demonstrating at the level of philosophy, but the masses seizing hold of the idea will turn it, as Mao put it, into a spiritual atom bomb. So this is another thing of this democratic materialism, yeah. The expression hit home and there was a silence, a thrilling silence. And this is Badiou's, you know, Maoism coming out, which is, you know, as if the bomb in question was about to go off any minute, right? And it was, if this is an intellectual terror, a daunting con uh, uh, c conviction, a profound doubt, who could tell in the living room open overlooking the port of Piraeus, right? <laughs> so this is interesting. They're still in the villa, right? Discuss, you know, in conversation in the villa, you know, and uh, et cetera. Uh, yeah. So a halted in the clear morning light coming off the sea. And of course, Thrasymachus, who'd been asleep, started to wake up and he stared at Socrates. This is how it ends on the, on the political. So um, um, 
But yeah, let's let, let's go let's go over this. This is going to be uh, I think interesting because Badiou doesn't think that you know there's a political philosophy. He's against the notion of political philosophy, but he's not against politics, right? <laughs> or the art of politics. In a way. So this is an interesting discussion because most academic departments, most people like to define themselves who do quote political theory as political philosophers, not as just doing politics, not mm -hmm. as just thinking or the thought of politics. But Jew is trying to eliminate that that kind of thinking, you know, uh, both uh, generically and and in thought. So, um, yeah, I mean, so again, I mean, you know, part of the opposition here again, and in, in terms of the polemics, and it's a very deep polemic with the sophists and so sophistry of which he locates three major tendencies, you know, in the, in the hermeneutic, in the game of interpretation, the circularity or the hermeneutical circle, you know, which is really goes back to Friedrich Schleimacher's uh, theological uh, interpretation reading of the gospel in uh, the 19th century in Germany. Friedrich Schleimacher is kind of the inventor of modern hermeneutics, and hermeneutics takes its name from Hermes, who was the cattle thief. You know, and then I think I mentioned to you Norman O. Brown's thesis in classics was uh, Hermes the thief, you know, uh, which was very interesting. He wrote uh, while he was working at the OSS before life against death. But anyway, all to say the hermeneuticals are then of course the analytical project where the, the whose concept, general working concept is rule. Rule, mm. R-U-L-E, rule, constant rule is, is working. And then of course the postmodern tendency, if you will, which is a deconstruction of the totality, the waging of the war against the totality, against the Hegelian totality and also one could say probably the Marxist totality, yeah, you know, in the 1859 right. preface to political mm -hmm. economy, right? And, you know, the way Marx worked was what worked in totality. And of course, Sartre, you know, who is another master thinker of the totality. So this war is, is on, you know, the grand narrative too. He's, he's very well aware of that. Most of you know that the postmodern uh, condition of Leo Thar, you know, sort of started, you know, it took a while to filter into the American Academy, but uh, you know, in this book, he he criticized the the grand narratives. They're no longer were the idea of emancipation, and the proletariat is exterminating angel of history is no longer valid. Yeah, he, he he says this right, and this is someone who was a member of socialist or socialism or barbarism with Castellanos, Claude Lefort and others who was very active politically and, and, and as a philosopher too. So who had kind of withdrawn from this, you know, and he, so he, he, he throws off this grand tradition, the idea of emancipation primarily, right? Yeah. And the, the project of the enlightenment as well. And part of the antagonism there was Jürgen Habermas. So we, we can, you know, speak about that too. Jürgen Habermas really wanted to go back the unfinished project of mm. the Kantian Enlightenment. And this was kind of the liberal left, if you will, right? The way of working through civil society, you know, kind of anti-revolutionary, right? In some ways, even though, you know, and our friend Peter Bratzis has a good joke, you know, Marcuse died at Habermas's house when he was 80 years old. He was visiting and staying with Habermas. And uh, Peter thinks he, Habermas poisoned him. So anyway, <laughs> you know, this is kind of funny, you know, that, uh, you know, that he was threatened by the return of the Frankfurt School because he had gone so far away from his masters. But, you know, it's a kind of, you know, in, 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 inner joke because Marcuse did not think like uh, Habermas at all, <laughs> you know, even though they remained friends. So um, anyway, I I just like to frame it that way because Badiou has many levels of antagonism here. One of the reasons he's going on, you know, he's going back to Plato to write this, you know, and 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 uh, you know, kind of engaging it. So, any any thoughts about this? I mean, I you know, I'm, I'm just trying to situate it as you know, sophistry is assigned a place in the communist, you know, society. You know, you, if you remember, they're they continue a discussion about the four states of government, and they're going to the fifth. Right. So Badiou's Republic is about, you know, in some ways, the idea of the fifth system of government, i.e. 
communism, right? And how do we how do we articulate this and think it through? So this this is this is where and what is the philosopher's role in this construction? And will the philosophers rule? Because this is, you know, Plato really believes that the philosopher should rule. This is a very important part of the Republic. You know, there's a discussion. I mean, the the actual uh, thing is, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, four um, eighty four um, um, four eighty four B in the Republic. Those able to grasp what is always the same in all respects, while those who cannot, those who wander among the many things, are not philosophers. Which of the two should be the leaders of the city? And this is the proposal from 484b, Socrates in conversation with Lacan, you know? Or is it the one that speaks to all, plays all the roles, thinks of the multiple always? Because he, in a sense, he's asking the question, does the postmodern tendency, or these tendencies that I just talked about, should they be ruling the city? Or should it be the one who is able to grasp which is always the same, which is a return to taking the, the totality again, mm -hmm. to think the totality again, to think the all, the whole. So this uh, this seems to me to be the, the the one of the crucial stakes in terms of who is to rule, who is to think this through. Because you know, some I, I think part of the attraction, at least to the part of the intelligentsia, is that you know you had thinkers who were revolutionary. I mean, Lenin read philosophy. He said, read mm -hmm. Hegel's logic. Then you'll understand capital. You know, he's he's going over. He has the philosophical notebooks. You know, we have this almost in everybody. Trotsky, another one. You know, nothing but intellectuals in terms of the leadership, and throughout Gramsci. You know, think think about this. You know, in the Soviet in Soviet Union, in um, uh, Italy, certainly in France, right to a degree. Yeah. Uh, you know, even though it was a very um, shaky uh, communist party in the 1940s and particularly in the 50s they lost a lot a lot of good people in the 50s because of their you know kind of staleness and orthodoxy but anyway um you know again it's this thinking of the same and then um how does political power and philosophy blend together mm -hmm. how do they come together and again we don't think of this as just you know uh political philosophy but how does you know, political power, you know, I think is better put, and philosophy blend together. How is it, you know, move together? You know, I, I know, uh, Eloy, that in Latin America, there was very active reading of Sartre's critique of uh, dialectical reason, I mean, among many of the radicals there. Certainly, Althusser had a, a, a place. Uh, Jacques Lacan had tremendous influence in Argentina uh, on the syllabuses of, of the academy. And uh, as Richard knows in Brazil uh, as well, I mean, maybe not as much in Chile or whatever, a very different moment, right? I mean, there should have been in Chile, we may have gotten Pinochet earlier, but, uh, but anyway, um, um, you know, this is important because I think the understanding was, again, philosophy and you know, political power, this re this relationship, not just doing politics or the political philosophy articulating, but what what is philosophy separate from politics, but at the same time, how do they blend philosophy and political power? And I think that's what he's up to. It's, compli it's complicated and, and, and a, a kind of nuanced gray area, but I think very important to, to think, it, think it through. So, yeah. So I'd like to begin there tonight. I'm I'm sorry to make it uh, more, more than you know was <laughs> directly in the reading, but uh, yeah, I think we can we can get something out of it. You know, politics is a thought practice. I don't know if you remember that. You know, politics is a is a, a thought practice. It is not only you know being in the streets. And and you know this is one of the things you know going back to uh, Aronowitz since I'm you know fresh in my mind from doing this. Uh, little TV thing earlier today, um, you know, Stanley always said, you know, protest is never enough, right? Yeah. It's not, it really doesn't do the job. Yeah, it's really, you know, that everybody's protesting. The question is politics as yeah. organized thought, right? And putting that to work, you know, and again, going back to what Eloy mentioned against the organ against the anti-intellectualism of the, of the moment.
which is massive in the United States. And it really, unfortunately, even worse on the, on the left in some ways than, than a lot of the other uh, positions, right? Yeah, tremendous, tremendous uh, anti-intellectualism on the left. Yeah, because of the separation that goes on. Activism, academic, right? This, this has always been a division that happens. And I think Baju is trying to, you know, fix that in some ways. So any, any I mean, I, I want to hear from you. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I could go on about this all, all the, the whole time. Yeah. And also, I want to go back to opinion. Yes, Jerome. Yeah. yeah. Um, it seems to me, though, that um, yeah. the, the only way in Baju's system, and, and this is central to his redoing of Plato, yeah. Right. Uh, for philosophers to rule is if that everyone's a philosopher, like the division of labor is totally smashed. And that's that's like one of the biggest differences in his rewrites of Plato. Um, and um, uh, the other thing about that is, is um, yeah, I guess I guess that's oh, the other thing about that, I think that's appealing is uh, by smashing the uh the division of labor, he kind of um, reinvents what's really unique about Marxism, and that's the criticism of work. Um, and it seems that that's at the heart of this rewrite. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, the notion of everyone is a philosopher is Gramsci. That's the first to really say that. <laughs> in it's a way. true. It's or, true. But yeah, with Gr please, Gramsci, yeah, yeah, he, said, he said yeah. uh, the yeah. philosophy, when everyone's a philosophy, philosopher in Gramsci's time, um, their philosophy is common sense. And, yes. you know, that's got to be smashed. Um, yes. And right. that's what Badiou is proposing. So right. it's kind of exactly. a build on Gramsci. Exactly. He's building on Gramsci. Gramsci is the first to say we are all spontaneous philosophers because we partake in language, which he defines as a determined, uh, not ideas in a vacuum or words devoid of sense, but a determined set of notions and concepts, language as, as such in that, way, in that way. And then, of course, common sense, which is really uh, taken from communist census as well, how are norms and values constituted, and also empirical sense is another thing that's being critiqued there in the second version of the Gramsci. And then the third, the third part of that, of course, is the folkloric tradition, you know, the telling of the tales, religion of which being the major ideology. And of course, Gramsci's, you know, going to be fighting the Christian Democrats throughout in the Catholic Church and goes into some very good analysis of uh, Jesuitism. And you're right, I mean, in a way, the struggle and the struggle for Gramsci, too, is the nucleus is common sense. And Badiou seems to overcome that, right, in a way. He, and this is where Althusser also takes up the ideological state apparatuses that's from the common sense. I mean, you know, Gramsci's influence is kind of forgotten <laughs> at these kind of levels because the French don't cite him so much, uh, you know, but use him very uh, effectively. So, yeah, Badiou is... is, is uh, certainly, uh, you know, working out of the common sense, you know, and then instead of a philosophy of praxis, right, in some ways, there's a different kind of notion of thought and politics that goes on, you know, the old, uh, uh, you know, thought and action is brought together, right, in a sense, because thinking for Badiou is action as well, you know, you have to think. And this is something yeah. else. Called. Yeah, yeah, Richard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I was yeah. thinking about how the term political philosophy kind of neutralizes the other. You yeah. know, if you if you reverse those words, which seems to me more in line with Badiou, which is to say philosophical politics. Um, and in regards to the anti-intellectualism, one of my uh, memorable Facebook experiences was mentioning Foucault somewhere and, and someone responded and said, the masses have no need for Foucault. The revolution comes from the masses. And, you know, it reminded me of this joke of there's, there's this insurance salesman who comes to sell insurance to this farmer and uh, the, insurance, uh, the insurance salesman stands next to the farmer. They look out at these grains of wheat and the insurance salesman goes, ah, this is God's country. And the 
And the farmer turns, looks at him and goes, God wasn't doing a lot with it until I came along. <laughs> All right, there you go. Yeah. yeah, back to the garden, huh? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. You know, the yeah. need for, yeah. uh, you know, right. the need for thinking. Uh, right, so. absolutely. Yeah, no, that's I, good. That's good. Yeah, Bruno, yeah, please. Right. Yeah. No, I, I was also thinking about this question of uh, precisely political philosophy, the way, not that, uh, but you deal with it, uh, especially in uh, um, right, the, the book. I went back to, I read this years ago, Meta Politics, right? Yeah. He makes the yeah, argument he against, in that um, book. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, for and, those uh, of you who don't know, uh, Badiou does critique the notion of political philosophy, right. uh, an essay on this, uh, actually. I mean, he's not the first to do that, but it is it is interesting in that regard. Yeah. So please go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I mean, uh, I, I was. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I remember when I read this. Uh, I wasn't sure. You know, I, I don't know if I agree. I mean, especially when uh, you look at this from uh, what you were saying earlier about Gramsci, it seems precisely to be uh, the um, opposite in a sense. I very much like what. Richard just said that perhaps there is this inversion instead of, uh, that's very nice, instead of political philosophy, it's uh, philosophical politics that he's uh, right, uh, putting forth, which is very interesting. It would be like um, a kind of almost philosophical anthropology in a sense, uh, right? But uh, it's interesting. And yet, I, I don't know, there is this uh, very important problem of the relationship, uh, of course, between theory and practice practice, praxis, I mean, that's what Gramsci also deals with. Baliba in the book on Marx that we spoke about right last time, mm -hmm. uh, the philosophy of Marx. But I'm not sure, you said that you would also, uh, right, we would address the question of, of truth uh, procedure. And I just, by going back to the small book on metapolitics, yeah, yeah, sure. I just you, happened you to see yeah. that he says, I, mean, uh, I might page, mention this, but before you go, I, I want to just yeah. mention one thing about Baliba. There are four conditions to uh, to thought, right? For Badiou, and and these these four conditions are basically mathematics, right? Um, um, the poetics, love, right? And uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the fourth. Um, I usually have this in, in my head. Um, yeah, I mean the other one is of course, um, uh, yeah, mat mathematics, art, love, and politics. These are the four conditions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mathematics, yeah. art, uh, love, and politics. So, by you, these are always conditions for the existence of any kind of um, philosophy, right? In the background, right? Yeah. Think, Michael, but politics think, becomes a condition for philosophy, not a political philosophy or a philosophical politics. Maybe, maybe a philosophical politics might be more accurate in a way. But these are the conditions for philosophy. Michael, did, I think yeah. that those those conditions for philosophy he brings up on page 188 again. Right, that's right. The context of the event. Yes. Uh, a passionate yeah. love, a political uprising, an artistic right. upheaval, or what have you. Right, that's right. And that's that's actually very interesting, just in terms of this um, uh, kind of th this dichotomy that you set up before between practice and thought and, right. and philosophy, in a sense too, is that thought also has to be engaged. Uh, by the event, in the event. Yeah. So, so I is... mean, go ahead, Bruno. I didn't mean to. No, 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 no. It's okay. Want, no, but in I fact, do want then... to situate. Listen again. We're reading by you, yeah, so yeah. for me to be faithful to the philosopher, you know, oh, at yeah, least yeah, in the beginning, we should critique, of course. No, so no, no. Know no how he's 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 building his thought. You know. Right, right. No, no, but it's okay. Doing. But yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry. Just precisely because by going back quickly, as we were speaking to the metapolitics uh, uh, book, yeah, I saw yeah. precisely he, he's saying right. If uh, politics, that's on page eleven. If politics is not a truth procedure, and you just clarify, it is one of the four truth yes. procedures, right? right? If it is in that, right, he's asking the question, what can it be for philosophy? I, I, I didn't read the whole uh, passage, but so the, the question is, uh, so politics must be, it is uh, for him a, a truth procedure for philosophy. And this is the argument against uh, Political, which is okay, you know. I mean, we can dismiss political. It's it's not, but I'm not sure that uh, I really uh, understand what that would be. I mean, now that Richard spoke about this inversion, very interesting. Yes, that that's it, a philosophical 
uh, polit uh, politics. But uh, the question is uh, that otherwise the problem remains of uh, precisely this uh, no relationship between uh, uh, theory and practice. So, so I mean, uh, so so that, that that's I, I mean I simply am saying going back to what Eloy also was saying that I I had to uh, say that uh, in uh, you know for my background maybe in Italy you know we, we have a similar situation as uh, what uh, Eloy you were describing no uh, in uh, um, in uh, uh, Latin America I mean that uh, the, the, the there is of, of course anti intellectualism everywhere. But the question is uh, precisely the question of uh, uh, a, a, a politics that is informed, right? I mean, an action that is informed by uh, theory. Again, I don't want to be too, you know, I don't want to uh, highlight the distinction in a, a way that is too uh, strong or clear cut, right, between theory and practice. But that, that's the problem. So I, I wonder what this uh, uh, getting rid of uh, uh, being done with. He says, "Political philosophy really would be. I mean, just you know, just to, to pose it, pose the question. You know, I'm not so sure. Uh, do I make sense? Uh, I mean, uh, that, that, that I I don't know. Even if if uh, politics is a truth procedure, isn't that precisely what uh, the philosophy of uh, politics, the for uh, political philosophy, would be?" Uh, well, maybe and maybe not. I mean, certainly in the tradition, the writing of political philosophy doesn't really aim towards the conditions of truth, right? In, in a certain way. I mean, you know, it's 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 it can be something else, right? I mean, John Rawls is a political philosopher, yeah. so right, but he's not he's not someone that's looking at politics as a condition for the existence of philosophy. Alongside, I mean. Try to think this in the in the total again with love and art and mathematics. You know, proportion, creation. Art could include, of course, poesis, right? Uh, you know, uh, all, all of these things are going on. And of course, the notion of love. And he has a whole section here. I don't know if guys got to it, but desire and drive and the philosopher. The difference between desire, love, and and drive which is kind of interesting too. I, again, I mean, listen, this is someone that synthesized again, a very, you know, again, an agglomeration of a lot of theory, you know, I mean, I, I can hear the echoes, obviously, and many of the, you know, resonations from everybody from Sartre to Lacan, to Althusser, to, you know, to Mallarmé, to Rimbaud, you know, going back in his own poetry, he mentions, you know, uh, the theater of which he's a playwright, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the point again is, is that he's not he's not trying to write a political philosophy here. The thought, you know, the the the, the again, what what the rewriting of the Republic is about is that it prefigures, right? In some ways, this Republic it re re prefigures, if you will, the new communism. It's the fifth set of government. This is what he's really trying to do with all this, because he sees in Plato an ability to take on these three things that I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the hermeneutics, the analytic, you know, the, the rule, the concept is the rule in language. And then of course the postmodern tendency, he wants to take on all these tendencies. And he thinks that Plato's the way out. I'm just saying what he's doing. That's all. No, no, no. I'm okay. not agreeing, you know, completely. Yeah. No, no, no. But I, I, I see what you say, and uh, I, it's not that, you know. I mean, I, I personally, um, even before reading uh, Metapolitics uh, by, by you, I, I always prefer the expression political ontology to political philosophy for, uh, you know, right. important reasons, right? Because right. it seems right. to me that that is already. Uh, right uh, by default, one might say that there is the idea that you are constructing precisely. It's, it's the production and therefore and poetic ontology uh, at that. Right. right. I mean, coming from the tradition also about having read uh, Vico, uh, particularly. Right. So I mean, I, I don't I don't disagree with the fact that as you say, I mean, you draw the example of say John Rawls and, and a whole tradition of political philosophy, of course, which is completely distant from. Uh, even the possibility of a, a, an action that, as you say, not in Marx, the thesis 11th on Feuerbach is to. So is this what he's uh, doing when he takes distance from 
political philosophy from the philosophy of politics. Uh, yeah, I was wondering. I, I, I mean, I think so. I mean, you know, okay. that's, that's, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's open to discussion. Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, he's really trying to develop here. I mean, look again, I, I situate this. Zizek, Bruno Bastilles, who's an interlocutor for Badiou as well, and Badiou himself, you know, started this movement, right, where in, in late uh, 2009, 2010, after Obama is elected, if you want to situate it, you know, post-election, come up with, you know, the communist hypothesis, the idea of communism, right, and the communist horizon, right? So this becomes you know, something that needs to be rethought, right? They want to, in, in fact, there are people in France, as you know, Etienne Balibar doesn't want to use the name anymore. It's too filled with, uh, you know, terror, if you will. It has, it has a bad name, so to speak. So there was a whole group of French intellectuals, as well as some of their friends in American universities. This is no longer uh, what we should be talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, uh, the, uh, Bruno, you know this as well as I do. You know, you had people like the the inoperative community, um, uh, Jean Luc Nancy. You know, the coming community, Giorgio Agamben. All of these things were going on as attempts, right, to think through what a new community would look like, right. So this is Badiou's, I mean, I guess contribution, if you will, and his. His his intervention, right? Yeah. If we can think of that that way, yeah, right. In, in a sense, and right. I, again, I don't think he wants to. Um, he, you know, again, he's he's using Plato uh, thematically. He's using the ideas here, but at the same time, this this reconstruction dialogically of the Platonic universe. You know, he calls it the cosmic cinema in other places. It's kind of interesting, the cosmic cinema, you know, that we're going to the cosmic cinema, you know, he, he, he is he's really attempting again to prefigure because he sees this as the fifth system of government, right? Yeah. Those Plato, that you, where have we had? We've had oligarchy, we have oligarchy right now. That goes without saying that we're ruled by oligarchic, uh, you know, with the fake news of the, uh, your vote counts or something like that, right? Yeah, in a way, yeah. you know, in terms of real substantive change. So we have a democracy, which leads to kind of like over, pro, pro, uh, you know, professionalization, too much meritocracy. We have, of course, tyranny. We can see that in the tyranny of the one. We've had this in many dictatorships. We see this in the world today as well. And then the fourth form he, he speaks to is democracy. And he's interesting on democracy, to my mind, you never get this in political philosophy, how you manage an opinion, right? How, how an opinion itself is managed. The democracy is the management of opinions, not of thought, but of opinions. But opinion is beyond ignorance. This is the interesting thing. Opinion is not yet thought, but it is beyond ignorance. So this is kind of interesting, right? You have these steps in here that are in the cave, where you go from the right opinion, right? <laughs> you know, you leave ignorance in the cave, and you're kind of on the path of the right opinion. You know, and this is soccer. This is elementary in some ways to the Socratic um, a moment, right? Where the the ignorance is left towards the right path, if you will, or the right opinion into hopefully then something beyond that. But what, what democracy for him is you know, in, in, in Bajun's sense, is, is kind of the management or the overall, you know, yeah, yeah, the overall, I mean, I don't know a better word, really, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, where you have hege hegemonic opinions, counter hegemonic opinions, right, in a way, some of which are not all grounded in ignorance, right, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, think about the use and the abuse of statistics, for example, mm. you know, think of our contemporary situations, how things are used, how they convince, how they persuade. And for, for Bajou, this is still in that moment, the, who's the expert in doing this is the sophist. You know, democracy mm -hmm. and this management of opinions, you know, the sophist becomes the, you know, the chief operator, yeah, in a way. And uh, at one point- the Salesman is Richard, you know, was talking about the insurance salesman. These are the, you know, the, the uh, what, what do they say in Yiddish? Uh, the the front person for the goyim, uh, the, the, what is it, the shawm? Uh, uh, it's some very great phrase. <laughs> it was kind of—I I can't remember. I think the, the shawarma or something like that uh, for the uh, for the goyim, right? It's a front person for the 
for the glory or something like that. But anyway, yeah, uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. No, at one point there is this, uh, no, the uh, the opposition between the philosopher and the philodox, uh, precisely, right? Yes, yes, right. Exactly. exactly. That's what yeah, he's but, doing. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's very, very accurate yeah. you know, in terms right. of the description. The right. philodoxa is the lover of opinion, or right. the friend to opinion, and the manipulator of opinion. Right. Oh, wow. Can I can I say something like just uh, uh, parenthetically, maybe for uh, later, maybe for uh, just a provocation for later? We're in many parentheses. I, yeah. I okay. No. 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 I was thinking when when you were speaking about this construction of the utopia, which is already, of course, in play, or then uh, taken up again by, by the yeah. very interesting project. I'm not saying. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, can, can we then maybe later? go back to this and think in terms of the utopia dystopia thing i i i told you that i just watched uh, finally the the host right uh, by uh bong joon ho i believe mm -hmm. no the korean oh, yeah. South great film great it's the best be film be better than parasite i don't know if I seen it but it's the <laughs> first film the... of his it's about you know the nuclear the experiment gone awry in asia that created the monster Right? right, right, it's great, and there is. A, know, a, it's, it's really so prevalent for today in terms of COVID. Yeah. You know, and you said Wuhan, we have this in, in yeah. South Korea, right? And you said yesterday when we were speaking on the phone about this allegorical, very much so poetic too. Yeah. And there yeah. is one line where there is this, uh, actually it's almost uh, epiphanic for the main character, right? Who says, uh, no, uh, when he discovers that there is no virus, that the whole thing built again, right? I mean, which is really, you know, so timely today too. Right, right. The question of opinion, therefore. Right. But it is, it comes together with the, the construction of a completely dystopic, uh, right, yes. uh, right, world. So, yes. I mean, we can... Um, and it's the, interesting, the monster that's created takes the victims to the cave. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that's yeah. where the monster takes the victims completely. I don't know if you've seen this. This is really uh, worth seeing. The host. It's his first right. film. It's much better. I mean, allegorically, it is so much more advanced than but, that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Too but much. if I may, I don't know how many of us have seen it. But I think that the best line is when uh, the small child who replaces the daughter, who's killed by the monster, finally, yeah. right? Yeah. This is more. Uh, boy that meets uh, right the, the girl in the cave uh, and right. then uh, when they watch tv after everything is over he says uh, let's turn it off and concentrate on eating yes uh, concentrate right. on that's food that's good. the most beautiful i yes. believe uh, I yeah, yeah, moment yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in any case, we can uh, maybe speak yeah. about this. I mean, maybe the well, coming. I, I like the metaphor I gave my students today. We were talking about uh, not not eating uh, properly and not, you know, we don't, no longer slow down and have long meals. You know, I mean, if you go to Bruno's house, you're going to have a long meal because yeah. the pasta is a, an art form, right? And <laughs> or or Peter's with Greek food, uh, etc. So you know, but we we were going to do a program. Food is thought. And, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, you know, food for and, uh, yeah, no, no. and then food for thought, right? Together, food yeah. as thought, right? But also food for thought. So I asked them to think about this in terms of their education. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes, let's eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So that, that that's good. No, I I hear you. And and uh, but let's go back to the host yeah, yeah, and yeah, in a sense, right? I mean. What what are you seeing here in terms of uh, you know relationship to Badiou in some ways? In uh, no, no. I mean, I was yeah. thinking that uh, perhaps there is uh, uh, and that they can be like parallel parallel uh, yeah. uh, paths into right. the construction of a uh, uh, communism, as uh, ultimately he also says. But uh, through the dystopic path, yes. yes, there is also the coming of uh, you know in. Uh, maybe a roundabout violent way, of course, I mean, but there is uh, ultimately also the possibility of uh, uh, the reshaping of uh, society as a whole, right? I mean, right. that's what Absolutely. I think in a sense Absolutely. is the lesson of the whole. I mean, think, think about it this way too, in terms of this management of opinion and the whole use and abuse of statistics. On the left, there's always, the, you have to answer the claim, Mao's killed 60 million people. Mao killed 80 million people. Always the statistic. The gulag, 20 million people. We always hear this, right? Going for, you know, going for. True or not true? It mm. doesn't really matter, right? In a sense. It, it ultimately 
doesn't really matter because what you're doing is you're trying to take these elements into the future because what's really being done there is just a manipulation of the quote right opinion right it's not really politics is thought it's the bad use or the instrumental use of political philosophy it has those purposes so if you maybe want to think of it that way i'm not trying to justify you know you know the the gulags or whatever you know but but anyway that's that's not my intention. You know, right. We have life learning learning camps, you know, and they, they'll maybe in some remote islands in the Mediterranean, ready, ready, you know, the life learning learning camps, ready. That's our, our kind of little joke, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm not so sure it's a, uh, uh, only a joke at this point, given what we're seeing out here. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. So uh, I, I think this is important to keep in mind that he's really trying to, you know, cut through this, you know, these these kind of uh, reactions, if you will. Yeah. So, but, but then, uh, what is this really the 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 the, the function, really the, the place of a politics as a truth procedure? And also because I, I mean, I don't know about you very well. So, what is really this truth procedure mm -hmm. and the four of them? I don't know if you want. Perhaps. Well, I think it would be better when we do the cave to really go into that in depth. I think it's going to be more important, you know, when we go through the allegory of the cave to go through his, his levels of the truth procedure. But so for right now, the conditions are interesting because this is what he's bringing up throughout, right? Uh, you know, this, this chapter on what is a philosopher and then the relationship to politics. These conditions are operative here, mm -hmm. right? Right? In, in Plato, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Truth, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the truth procedure does include, you know, the undoing of, if you will, the right opinion, right? Uh -huh. The undoing of it. And it also requires, if you will, the mathematical, in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. It's part of the, what requires the mathematical in the truth procedure. For my view, ultimately, it's not the poetic ontology as it is for Heidegger and many of the thinkers of the, the, the ontology is mathematics. That, that's, that's, that's where the failure has been. He takes his point of departure from Jean Cabellet's, Albert Lautmann, as I was saying, you know, a very different tradition that we're accustomed to in the United States. It really is this mathematical ontology that is where the, where the truth procedure is. Yeah. So you, you, you have this, um, you know, constantly working. And this is in, I, ne next week I'll bring, uh, I, I don't want, I don't want to get interrupt and go get it off the shelf, but I'll, I'll give you the passages that are relevant from being an event, his ontology that he wrote in the 80s. And then the second ontology is Logic of Worlds, in which, you know, he examines these truth procedures vis-a-vis -vis mathematical reasoning. So th th this is very, very important to, re to, to remember. Yeah. I mean, it's not Heideggerian in the sense that you're unveiling something. He's, a, he's against that kind of hermeneutic. Yeah. This is not his, his, his way. Anyway, his way in is through mathesis, in through, you know, coming over the line. He, he thinks that Aletheia leads to more, more kind of illusions, if you will. So, but it is ju just to use uh, also, you know, a, a, a different word. It is a kind of a verification, ultimately, process of a, not that takes, I mean, yeah, it's a verification procedure process. seems to yeah, be. Procedure, yeah. procedure, it's in the word, the truth procedure. Yes, yes, yes. In which you have a hypothesis. The hypothesis here is communism. But what ultimately becomes the truth of this, of this system, this fifth system of government. You know, I mean, really, in a sense, he's saying, look, we have the tools for a critique of all these other systems of government, right? And their, their failures. We know how to do this. But now we need, you know, another, the, the, the fifth government that will give us this kind of, you know, verifiable, you know, d drive towards utopia, if you will, right? Or as, as Jerome was saying earlier, you know, where everyone is a philosopher, the division of labor is no longer operative. You know, the why work, the zero work is going. I mean, all of this is incorporated in this too. Yeah. 
in many ways. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting that um, that yeah, he yeah. paints uh, Socrates as being quite pessimistic that it's actually possible to enact some of these, you know, to the fifth yes. yes. state. I mean, I, I was drawn to page 189. Yeah, okay. Where, Why don't we go uh, there? Yeah, good to go to the text. Yeah. Where he was talking about um, right here. Yeah. just okay. the kind of the cheerful abyss of the uh, of public opinion that ultimately culminates in the internet. <laughs> so right, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Nothing but, yeah, yeah. No, this is very good. This is in the context, again, of uh, uh, don't think that young people, this is the bottom of 188, thank you, Josh, uh, mm -hmm. that are corrupted because they unfortunately came across bad teachers, inveterate uh, sophists who are merely peddlers of rhetoric, after all. No, no. The professional moralists on TV who deplore those unfortunate, these unfortunate encounters, the politician who denounce these so-called philosophers' bad influence at their political rallies are ultimately the greatest of sophists themselves, the ones who are constantly generating the propaganda hype responsible for confusing youth and for dooming it to the misery of nihilism. But where, when, how does it happen, asked Glockall, who was ready to take on the whole army of corruptors right then and there. Quite simply, through that constant day-to-day -day ubiquitous babble of voices, gently terrifying, amicably constraining, and cheerfully relentless, that's called freedom of opinion, right? Facebook posts, Twitter, Instagram, you know, you can add it all on, all on there, right? On TV, in the theater, in the papers, in election rallies, when the official intellectuals hold uh, forth, and even when you just get together with friends for a drink and to shoot the breeze, what do you see? What do you hear? Everyone either criticizes or applauds statements, ideas, actions, wars, movies, and a big free-for-all with no universally valid rational principle. There's a sort of vague, vaguely aggressive, joyful, yet sinister extravagance about the booing and the applause alike. It is though the big glass exteriors of the buildings were echoing all throughout the city, the same seemingly conflictual but actually consensual babble, seemingly conflictual but ultimately very good, huh? Conce actually consensual babble of voices that composed of all these opinions, which are so bitterly incompatible with one another that no single one prevails except the one that decrees, I am free at any rate to say anything I want. And it's that anything I want that destroys the philosophical nature. Again, this, this section is philosophy and politics, and what is a philosopher, right? And what is the nature of the philosopher, so to speak? You know, I mean, he's going through the nature being, you know, an aspect of the, of the personality or the, the type. What can become of a young man or woman's thinking when it's up against the power of the incoherent babble of voices that sweeps away any idea of truth and crushes it to bits? Or of what avail is an education that is itself incoherent, and this is everywhere today, and already caught up in the swirl of anonymous opinions? Won't young people eventually start to judge things the way the dominant babble of voices does? When it comes to what's beautiful or ugly, moral or immoral, right? fashionable or outdated, won't they end up dumping their own bucket of water in the muddy stream of unverifiable information and unfounded opinions symbolized by the internet? <laughs> Very good. You don't have a lot of confidence in our ability to resist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wind of Mantha, right? Here she comes, right? Yeah, yeah. not really. <laughs> oh, but resistors will be dealt with appropriately. If you're not a middle of the road Democrat, a dire support of freedom of opinion, You'd better watch out. You're going to have representative legislation forbidding you to do this or that. Your name will be dragged through the mud. They'll build police stations and prisons to punish the youth uh, rebellion. And looming on the horizon when the situation gets tense, there may even be death, as some predict will be inflicted on me. You know, that's Socrates speaking, of course, before the trial, the, the, sophist, the, the sophist trial that, uh, you know, I think Badiou refers to. 
But can we oppose this tyranny of opinion, again, the tyranny of opinion, uh, asked Lacan, by disseminating, and this is interesting, clandestinely, if need be, the philosophy of truths. Here's your, you know, I already told you that won't suffice. No one has ever changed or really ever change anybody merely through moral lessons. This is why, you know, people say, oh, we have to expose the president of the university. Like they care, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, really, honestly, you know, they care about the scandal. You think Trump cares about what you think about his non-payment of taxes? Or, or, you know, half of the country could care less anyway. Some, half of the people admire it. Look what he got away with, $750. <laughs> you know, Trump Tower and $750 tax bill, right? In some ways, it's kind of funny, you know, the cowboy culture at work, yeah. right? This kind of, you know, uh, American mythology that plays out through him in some ways. Philosophy can only be effective, and I think this is very important, and thank you, Josh, again, if the political divine has intervened first, if some event interrupts the consensual routine, if some organized action has shown what it means to be implacably opposed to prevailing democracy, when there's real action of the sort dictated by principles, and this is interesting, he'll take Arche versus Doxa, right? Which is, again, a Socratic moment, the Arche, you know, the principle, which also means by command and <clears throat> obedience, too is in the word for principle in Greek, the, the, ar, the ar, arche, right? Dict not opinions at a local level, then the philosophical idea can bring out its universal significance. In states corrupted by the democratic disguise, and I mean, these are very interesting phrases he's using here, that conceals the power of the rich and ruthlessly ambitious, anything that can res rescue thought and justice is nothing short of a secret god. And what is exactly this providential hidden God, that <laughs> she asked probably, <laughs> the unpredictable event. And this is interesting because revolution, rupture, if you will, you know, a revolution as rupture is always unpredictable. The emergence of a rallying cry and a collective organization that couldn't have been foreseen in the ordinary confused babble of opinions and their so-called freedom, right? The old secret societies in a way, yeah? Very interesting, you know, um, you know how this worked. You know, the, the you know Babouf's, the conspiracy of equals, Gracchus Babouf during the French Revolution, the conspiracy of equals. This goes on in history all the, the time. We forget this. You know, the Communist International, the early stages were, were a secret society. <laughs> this was not something that was like out in the open. If you believe Marx's rhetoric of, you know, our communists now come out to put out our principles in 1848. Just think of all the underground activity that went on, you know, uh, uh, throughout throughout that time. So this is very interesting, right? But then what happens to the philosophical nature that isn't lucky enough to encounter its event God? And again, for Baju, event is politics as thought and politics is action together. The French Revolution, the Paris Commune, the Bolshevik Revolution, and for him, May of 68, which is certainly all, they're questionable. I mean, May of 68 is certainly questionable, even though it was that, that uh, you know, this, this moment of all power to the imagination for some, but you know. Okay, go ask the philosophers for hire, or the media, and this is good, the philosophers for hire, the new itinerants, who go the sophists that are for hire, right? Or the media loudmouths. Their norms of action, when they're quick to call knowledge and even thought, merely synthesize whatever the state of the prevailing babble of opinions <laughs> is at the moment. And Bruno, I mean, this is giving us an idea of how he's going to work the truth procedure against the doxa, right? And the archaic, right? Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Their philosophy panders, and uh, again. The, the verb panders as the salesman, the itinerant salesman, the sophist, once again, panders, right, to whatever exists and is dominant. Imagine a man whose job is to feed a big animal with a thick coat of fur and big long teeth. He carefully observes its instinctive behavior and desires. He learns how to approach and handle it without taking any risks. He knows how to interpret its cries and modulate his own tone of voice so that the animal on hearing it, will either be gentle or fierce. To this sort of empirical observation, the man gives the name 
life science. While he's at it, he writes a big treatise on Zen science, which he teaches at the university as if it were the last word in modernity. He has absolutely no idea what, out of all the animals' desires, habits, growls, and reaction, deserves to be called just or unjust. Interesting, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was doing this, you know, this descriptive phenomenology in a certain way, right? Versus that of, you know, a political or at least a, an understanding of what the just and the unjust is, right? He has absolutely no idea, yep, et cetera. He couldn't care less about the guinea pigs in most truth, it's inner being. The only thing that matters to him is the counterpart of opinions, that is, the big animals, repetitive behaviors, and stereotypical reactions. Our professor of life science calls the things the animal seems to like good and the things that makes it angry bad. A professor, though he may be, he's unable to justify these terms, right? Quite simply because he conflates justice and beauty with the physiological physio physiological necessities of survival. His science is nothing but sophistry. He's giving a good example here of a kind of sophistry. And this goes on all the time in all kinds of graduate programs, all kinds of, uh, you know, quote, scientific inquiry. But he doesn't have to know the basic difference between necessity and truth. Do you think a character like that could be a useful instructor for true life of, of, that we're trying to divine? Of course not. But is this professor of life science really any different from those who call the empirical knowledge of the undifferentiated desires of the people under the dictatorship of volatile public opinion, political science? So this is where he's taking on political sinus, as we like yeah. to call it, S-I-N-I-U-S, <laughs> S-I-N-U-S, you know, it gives you a problem in your, your, your sinal passages, your nasal passages, <laughs> right? And, and or, you know, political philosophy, if you will, you can substitute there, right? You know those people who do surveys to find out um, 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 who has political, what pillar has political import, the way others, the proponents of the science of the aesthetic. You know, every day we read statistics, mm -hmm. Biden up by 3% mm -hmm. in, in North Carolina, you know, up, up by 2% in Wisconsin, too close to call, all this kind of stuff. Every day we're being shaped, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of hope and fear, you know, as we go mm -hmm. forward. This is a perfect example of what's going on. You turn on the TV, which I don't do, you know, but anyway, you're going to get Rachel Maddow, uh, you know, Hannity, you know, uh, uh, what's her name, Laura Ingraham, or, uh, you know, on Fox News, the MSNBC crowd, even on the Amy Goodman programs, these latest polls, yeah. right? the latest movements, yeah. right, in some ways, you know, democracy now is now be called DNC now, you know, Democratic National Committee now. In some ways, you know, there's a kind of joke going around. Someone says, you know, I voted for Biden and I vomited. And then someone replied, I voted Green Party and I, I saved myself for the uh, upchucking or something like that. You know, this is this is kind of interesting that this is the, the level we've come to. You vote for someone and you get sick mm -hmm. after you cast your vote. You know, this is interesting that, you know, this this whole this whole uh, strategy that, that it's going on, you know. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and I mean, Cornell West, by the way, is an excellent example of sophistry at this moment. The anti-fascist vote, that's how it's being thrown. The anti-fascist vote, Trump. I'm telling you, Trump's not smart enough to be a fascist, no. you know, or the people around him, you know? But, uh, I mean, in a really true sense. What? What's that? The Black Agenda, uh, which Glenn Ford wrote something today on the Black Agenda on uh, voting for uh, Joe Biden and the... And, uh, Voting against Joe Biden, or, or no, he was, I mean, and he mentioned the People's Movement Party and all that stuff too. Yes, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's interesting to me, and I think everybody in this room probably can relate to this: <clears throat> the failure of the left is to build a political formation. Hmm. That's what's really lacking here. This is why we're faced with this problem, this faith in the Democratic Party. I mean, this is another thing that's been very manipulated, you know, and this this whole logic of you're going to move him to the left. You talk about sophistry going on. I promise you, watch watch what happens with Sleepy Joe and Vice President Warden after after she gets in power. Believe me. Believe me. Yeah. Yeah.
I mean, I hope you're not fooled, you know, in a sense. I mean, I, I know I know that it's, you know, going to be better, at least in terms of projection and the logic of appearance to have a Biden-Harris in the White House rather than, you know, the evangelical right, you know. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, again, uh, you know, speaking of uh, this kind of management and, and political organization, you know, Chris, Chris Hedges, uh, you know, has studied this many, many years. The 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 um, and maybe Lydia knows about this. They're they're kind of what were called um, crisis cults out there, where they they recruit people who are in crisis, and they basically it's a, like a religious and political movement. And the, the the new right, the neocons are expert at this. And you know, Amy uh, uh, Comey Bryant is a kind of a product of this. Uh, Barrett, I'm sorry. Oh uh, uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm just you know. Yeah, so uh, this is interesting, these, these crisis cults that are being studied by anthropologists. You know, that people go into these cults because they have no place to go. And they, they build a politics around this. This is not like the suicidal thing of Jonestown, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the thing of the, uh, the 70s. And, uh, but Lynn yeah, Gates. something more deeper that built, that's built up. What were you going to say, Josh? I'm sorry. Kevin Gates was the one in the 90s. Oh yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's uh, yeah, Heaven's Gate. Yeah, exactly. Which was a pretty good movie, by the way. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, you know, they're very good at mobilizing these uh, these kind of things. You know, uh, and and also on the left, you've had this. You've had the Sullivanians. You've had certain movements in leftist politics. Uh, the the uh, what was it? Fred Newman, and uh, there was a. a woman who was in politics in New York City. You had all these kind of moments too on the left as well. So they were thoughtless, ultimately, thoughtless. And and I think Baju, you know, again, very well aware of this in this passage. Let me, let me just finish uh, this passage. But I, I think it's interesting for us to realize that this neo-right thing that we're looking at, this Trump, that all is, has got so many people traumatized. It's part of a very long program, long program. <laughs> a very, very long program that began in the 70s. You know, they mm -hmm. never forgave America or the United mm -hmm. States for taking down Nixon. And mm -hmm. they mobilized right away. You know, Christian evangelicals in yeah. the prisons. No more Black Panthers. No more Malcolms in the prison. But Christian evangelicals. I owe it all to God. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for my entrepreneurial capital. Think, think about yeah. this, too. Taking over the school boards, you know, the defunding yeah. of education, et cetera. Yeah, 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 yeah. You think this kidnapping, this attempted kidnapping in Michigan? That's Betsy DeVos at work. <laughs> that's not that's nothing you know i mean i'm you know they're going to come after me now you know but anyway <laughs> yeah right i'm going to go up against 10 billion dollars anyway <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway think about this who's who's her brother who has that kind of militia disposal at their at their fingertips eric prince blackwater now turned into something else again this kind of private militias that are existing too in a, in a certain way yeah so, um, um, you know, it, it, to, to me, this is worthy of, you know, being real, you know, in, in a sense. What are we really facing here? And in, 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 in how we manage so much, you know, by, the, by not having the truth, not having, you know, the truth procedures at work. I've watched this. I mean, I know people like I grew up in New Orleans where this new Supreme Court judge is from. I, I know this this kind of, you know, Dominican, you know, kind of, uh, you know, educated uh, uh, people. People of Praise is, a, is an offshoot organization. It's not even the big Catholic church. Uh, you know, the big Catholic church in New Orleans is next to Tulane University. Holy name. She didn't go to that church. That church is for, you know, quote, the true Catholics, the wealthy Catholics, et cetera. <laughs> she went to a very different kind of uh, religious uh formation during that period. And then you have to ask the question, what kind of reading is going on of the Constitution? This is another thing. Look at the adjectives that have been used to describe her by both the left, too. I mean, I mean, or the left, the left liberals in Congress, right? The, you know, yeah, even though they don't show up. The original, yes, the originalist, but also this mm -hmm. kind of textual, textual literacy 
right? Li mm -hmm. You know, literalness, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And this the originalist is a part of Scalia, but even earlier. Again, they never for forgot or forgave Bork. These are the things that we don't really look at because they mobilize immediately around this. You know, uh, th th this is important to keep in mind as you go as we go forward. You know, I mean, even if Biden uh, wins, you know, there are a thousand Trumps in the in the in the wings. Mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, <laughs> they really are. Maybe not as you know, not mm -hmm. as media produced. I heard that Fifty Cents. You know who I who I met the the rapper Curtis, right? <laughs> he said the Biden tax plan is going to make me twenty cents. Yeah. You don't call me fifty cent anymore. I'm going to be twenty cents. That that's that's the use of of rhetoric that plays mm -hmm. to a good part of the American audience. Yeah. In, in a way, as we go forward, and already. that may turn some. I'm sorry. What? I think he's bankrupt already, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I think he's, he's already bankrupt. He's bankrupt. Oh, I see. He, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's not going to pay taxes then. Okay. Well, maybe Biden will give him a tax write-off. We'll, we'll promise. We'll promise Curtis a tax write-off. Yeah. yeah. I've had the great honor of having one of Chuck D's uh, um, uh, girlfriends in my, one of my classes, and I had one of Fifty Cent's uh, <laughs> persons too. They always write. He, he goes by Curtis, Professor. You know, <laughs> officially, right? It was funny. So. Uh, Anyway, um, back in the day when LIU was a fun place to teach. Anyway, not anymore. Too many white people. Excuse me. <laughs> anyway, in any case, since they don't pr 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 provide any reason criticism and never get to the bottom of things, going back to the majority of TV viewers, these people only serve to confirm in the public's mind that a majority opinion, simply by virtue of being a majority, mm -hmm. is beautiful and good. The majority opinion, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very good. This is a very good exercise. Thank you, Josh, again, for these pages here, you know, in, in philosophy and politics, which is a reading of Plato's, you know, Republic 484 to 502C. Um, you know, um, anyway, of, of, you know, how the management of opinions works, how it is so solidified in this in this culture. You, that you and I can easily prove it's a ridiculous uh, um Conclusion, if the question of the movement of the planets had been submitted to the law of the majority opinion, we'd still believe today that it's the sun rising and setting, which revolves around the earth, of course, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, again, you know, we see it set every day in New Jersey at, uh, you know, at six o'clock, you know, <laughs> goes down, you know, across the Hudson, right? Anyway, so... Um, then he goes on, uh, that's my favorite example, et cetera. Then. But the argument of compelling one able to turn all your friends away from the cult of number. So Bruno, here we go, from the majority rule electoral system and from the dogma of freedom of opinion, the cult of number, you know, which is what's the algorithmic governmentality that we hardly really talk about is based on. You know, this is what we're really being based on, the algorithmic governmentality, right? And to me, uh, yeah, I, yeah, please. Yeah, 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 of know, course. I just took this section to kind of point to what Bruno is actually uh, talking about initially about um, okay. say, phil philosophical politics is that really it was a critique of positivism ultimately about this, uh, you know, science by, um, you know, census or consensus and, and science by, um, what do they call that, survey and, and all these kinds of ways that they justify. Um, these disciplines now, I guess. T. Wright Mills had a very good talk, uh, a, a term for it, abstract empiricism. Mm -hmm. mm. okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Abstract empiricism. Yeah. And, and Alex, was was was, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. No, just who was that? C. Wright Mills, C. Wright the Mills. sociologist, the sociological imagination. Yeah. 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 First rate thinker, someone forgotten too. Yeah. Yeah, died very early. Yeah, he used to ride his motorcycle where uh, Richard lived, all all up and down Columbia, really? terrorized people. He loved that bike and leather jacket. And this this was a character late fifties, early sixties. You know, well before you know the popularity. Uh, <laughs> you know, the James Dean, if you will, of uh, academia, <laughs> the outsider. Yeah, 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 kind of interesting. So let, let me just go on here real quickly because. Yeah, so I admit they're often impressed for a few minutes, but then they back away that democracy 
And this is interesting because he's going to define democracy in many ways. And this is one democracy, the freedom to say anything you want is still the best thing about the modern world, right? At this bottom of 191. That's because it will require a long effort and a well known radical transformation of humanity for everyone to accept that the synthesis of creation and eternity is brought about by new beauty rather than the wide variety of objects that opinion declares to be beautiful. And again, this is part of the platonic universe of crossing the line where you're in the abstraction of what is the beautiful rather than just using one's senses or sensory perception in the bottom of the cave. You know, he's, he's working off of this, and we'll get to more of this next week. But, but anyway, the, the, this is important. And then he goes on, and more broadly speaking, that it's the mathematics of being that matters, not the existence of many different particularities. And he's beginning to show, you know, his mathematical ontology here. But what can we do until such time as that whole long effort has been accomplished? Not to be surprised, and I like this, not to be surprised, in any event, by the attacks on philosophers that will come from all sides, whether from those who only believe in prevailing opinion or from demagogic politicians who are only interested in being reelected. It must be really tough to be a philosopher as you understand the term. How can anyone resist pressure like that? <laughs> it's even harder you think, dear girl. Yeah, here we go with the patronizing, right? Imagine mm -hmm. a young person who is clearly endowed with a thirst for all that's worth it being thought and experienced. And this is interesting too, this kind of hunger, right? And thirst for, for, for knowledge, right? He was frequently regarded as the exceptional child. He stands out in his age group. And as a result, his parents and his whole family circle want to push him in the direction of a brilliant, lucrative career. They'll simultaneously flatter him and use them for his, their own purposes. And this is very good. I want to just make a side remark here. I, I suggest for a real interesting study of this child that's doted upon and reaffirmed as brilliant all the time, and but is done in the parent's name, by Jean-Paul Sartre's short story called The Childhood of a Leader. It is an exceptional psychological study in, in fascism and the fascist personality. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, yeah. Childhood of a, the Childhood of a Leader. It's really incredibly, you know, I'm beginning to think of Sartre as a greater psychologist than a philosopher. I'm, you know, as I, you know, read him more and more. I just see a first-rate psychologist at work. It's uh, it's unbelievable to me, you know, the ability that he has in looking at people's motivations, how he looks at, at childhood, and, and probably most of you know his his unfinished work, but it was a, he, he finished about uh, 2,000 pages of it, The Idiot of the Family, a study of Gustave Flaubert, and there are 800 pages just on Flaubert's ages three to five. Right, on Genesis and Constitution. Yeah, anyway. Uh, so uh, I just need to put that in there. Okay. Though you but but also, oh, Michael, yeah, also, yeah. Also, no, also the book on Genet. I mean, in a different yeah. the existential psychoanalysis yeah. of Jean Genet. Yeah. I don't recommend reading the Mallarmé. It's not that good. And uh, the Baudelaire of Benjamin is much better. But it's, it's good. Not, yeah. method, right? They have a whole section on Flaubert, too, right? He writes about that. The what, John Flaubert? I'm sorry? In search for a method, a progressive, regressive. Yes, yes. He it. starts on that. He's working on Flaubert. He felt very close to Flaubert. Yeah. In many ways. It's kind Maybe of it's like Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> oh, you know, Ma Madame Bovary dates for the French, you know, literary uh, critics. It, it dates, uh, um, you know, the, the modern novel. You know, this is mm -hmm. this is where the modern novel begins, is with Madame, Madame Bovary. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, what they love about him is his future power. This is interesting, right? What the, what the family loves about him. they'll they'll persuade him to put the qualities of the philosophical nature, and this again the nature here is is described, and this is very good. The thirst for learning, learning all the disciplines of knowledge, memory, courage high-mindedness to use in the sordid competition of the worlds of business, the media, 
or ordinary politics. This is the great sellout of thought. Mm -hmm. This is Badiou, I think, speaking subjectively about why he never joined the Mitterrand government, right? Or participated in, you know, quote, French socialism. He always stayed on the margins. He would not give in. And he wrote many, many things about this, you know, whereas you had Roland Barthes is visiting Mitterrand all the time. Jacques Derrida went to the to the uh, to Versailles multiple times to talk to to Mitterrand, you know, etc. Badiou would not do it. He felt that they were selling out thought, you know, to to the, to the government at that time. Just to just to give you a, a bit of you know, and and again, this was uh, as you know in the 1980s. You know, there was no accident. The first year of French socialism, it was the best performing stock market in the in the world of the Mitterrand government. Yeah. People forget this. Yeah, <laughs> it's a way of getting France up to speed, you know, in terms of the shadow of the Deutsche Mark and before the, the the switch to the euro. Part of a very concerted plan, in my 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 estimation. But anyway, and as if this young prodigy has to be born in a rich, arrogant imperial state, there's a great danger that the corruption of his native abilities will lead him, as was the case with the young Alcibiades, who was nevertheless my friend, to become so fascinated by power. Ultimately, our well-born young man will entertain wild hopes, even go so far to imagine he can unite all the peoples of the world under his leadership and oppose the law of his own desires on the whole world. Here we go. The fascist personality, how it happens, right? In a, in a, in a kind of nutshell, in a way. And also, how so many people, I, I remember I was having coffee. I mean, I have many experiences like this. I mean, it's like they attracted to me. I'm sitting in a cafe, um, Magazine Street in New Orleans, about 10 years ago. And I was reading, uh, I think it was a critique of Habermas. And this guy sits next to me. Oh, yeah, I read this stuff. You know, yeah, we, we use this in advertising. He goes on a whole thing about how he studied Habermas in school and how he uses it in advertising, right? And it's a, the, you know, the, lot, the communicative action and the mm. principles of communicative action. Mm. I mean, it's no surprise that David who's been there, you know, et cetera. But this is, this is what goes on, you know, uh, constantly. And we have to be aware of this, you know? Uh, I watch every day the, Can the Quebec government spin on the COVID. You know, you hear every day, it's, it's it's like differently, you know, and they're they're trying to be so nice, talk to everybody, and at the same time, they create the red zones, and we will punish you $6,000 if we catch you in a bar, you know, $6,000 if we catch you seated in a restaurant, you know, all this kind of stuff. So you begin to see how this is articulated because, you know, uh, Quebec and Canada in general is built on the liberal model of a man named Will Kimlicka, who's a liberal theorist. I, I guess Eloy knows Kimlicka's work. You know, he's the he's the major thinker of liberalism in, uh, in, uh, in, in Quebec, liberalism with a human face. He and Charles Taylor, et cetera. It's good to know these things because, you know, again, you know, people who get taken in. You know, in, 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 in many ways. Uh, so anyway, ultimately, yeah, he goes, he, he'll unite all the people. You've been influenced by what happened to the wonder of Alcibiades. You loved him, I know. You know, Alcibiades, you know, is, uh, Socrates is a quote, imaginary or maybe actual lover. But so spectacular and incurable was his intoxication with power that when you approached him to quietly tell him the truth, that he was losing his sanity, could only get it back by devoting himself utterly and selflessly to it, he found it very hard to tolerate his old teacher's attempt to hold. Socrates said he actually did feel the force of my arguments. He was secretly in agreement, but the people around me were terrified at the thought of losing all the perks stemming from their political and military victories. Those parasites swarming among them did anything they could to turn him away from my teaching. And where I was concerned, they stopped at nothing in their efforts to destroy me. They set traps, they slandered, they plotted to have me dragged before the courts. And that's how Alcibiades eventually gave up on becoming a philosopher. How sad, what a bummer, et cetera, et cetera. So Alcibiades is next page is the classic example of that all that it takes for opinion to take over truth's place and for the power of money and influential connections to be dangled tantalizingly before the young. 
anyway, I'll just end there. I mean, this this is a very interesting uh, uh, section on again a definition of democracy again as the management of opinions, right? Democracy as you know the quote First Amendment right, the power to express yourself. You know, a lot of people come in the United States. Oh, at least you can speak your mind. The question is to whom. And for what? Right? Does anyone care? Does yeah. anyone really care? Is yeah. anybody listening? And what Badiou in some ways, this is very interesting to me, Brecht in early early uh, uh, writings on radio theory says, you know, the, when the radio was invented, he says, now the bourgeoisie have an instrument, right? It's interesting. Well, now the bourgeoisie have an instrument of which they can, you know, purport all their 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 uh, propaganda to. So then he says he says about that. Breck says the problem is the bourgeoisie has nothing to see, say, and that they're at, there's basically listeners who want to listen but have no one to speak to them. So eventually the the listeners are so dried up or so you know frustrated they'll listen to anything. So it's a very interesting uh, thing, you know, the control of the apparatus is what Breck's talking about, and Badiou too here, which is very, very interesting to me. So anyway, I, I don't know any, any thoughts about this, and then it goes on. They talk about the dialectic uh, later. It's the first time the word is really brought up as a, as a term. We're going to get into this, you know, in, in terms of the, from the mathematical uh, 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 ideal to, to the dialectics, and chapter uh, 12 of Badiou and also book seven of the Republic, which still is worth reading and rereading. Because our question again would be, are we like Frary and, and Gramsci, et cetera? We do, do we go back down into the cave at this point? Or do we think this through at a different level? Are we, are we wasting energies at, uh, uh, you know, on this? This is, this is a question we can ask because they debate this whether you should go back down into the cave to educate, right? And this this will be another question that could be raised, in a sense. You know, J.D. Bernal, Martin Bernal's father, uh, who was the, the, an English Marxist, really believed in an aristocracy of science. This was the British Marxist take, you know, in the 1940s and 50s. They wanted to create, they thought they knew what the world should be like and that they were a vanguard. You know, and that they were the vanguard. This was this was the British moment in British Marxism. And J. D. Bernal, Science as a Social Action, as many other books. He was a metallurgist and a member of the British uh, uh, Party, right? And uh, very connected to uh, to Fibley, Fibley, and and others in the uh, in the uh, secret uh, in the M. I. Uh, uh, five at that time uh, moments. Um, but anyway, he, he really believed that there should be an aristocracy of uh, uh, an intellectual aristocracy coming back. So he did believe this. You know, that the philosopher king was the modern science scientist, in a sense. And you know, in some ways, the way the politicians speak today, the reference is always, always um, uh, to the authority. The appeal is always to science now, if you've noticed in politics. The science tells us, you know, we have to listen to the scientists, right, et cetera. So this is another kind of appeal that's going on to authority. And there doesn't seem to be much of a critique that there could be, you know, something <laughs> off there, right? Or why is this authority being positioned this way going forward? Of course, this is going to move towards vaccines and big pharma, but I, I think it's worth considering. Why so much of this at this point? Yeah, I mean, I know there's a pandemic. I'm, I'm the first to acknowledge this. You know, I, I mean, I wash my hands 20 times a day. I feel like a total neurotic every time I come home. You know, <laughs> wash your hands, wash your hands. You know, <laughs> etc. <cetera, laughs> you know, <laughs> etc. And Bruno comes over. He's got the Kleenex. He opens the doors with. I'm going, oh my god, what have we come to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. So, but anyway, but the science, you know, that's this new appeal to authority and, and, and uh, you know, all, all, the, all the senses. So anyway, uh, you know, uh, this rule, the philosopher king, you know, this is another thing. This is what Badiou is thinking about. And I don't know if Bruno wants to speak to this. You know, what Plato proposes is a society that is ruled by philosophers, 
right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, Jerome had added earlier, everyone will become a philosopher. But in the beginning, the levels of abstraction are not available to everybody. Yeah. Any thoughts, Bruno? Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, I, in fact, I like what Jerome said before. I mean, and that's, of course, not what Plato is speaking about when he says the right, because there is the hierarchical structure in Plato, yeah. of course. And uh, I mean, I, I, I've always seen this as a very problematic uh, proposition, right? I mean, what does that mean? Although, I mean, if one thinks of it uh, in the proper way, it makes sense as well. I believe that this is what you were um, no, addressing uh, just uh, a moment ago. I mean, uh, the, the question of, uh, and this is ultimately also what I like, uh, um, now that I'm getting, you know, closer to, but you, I mean, uh, the, the, the idea of, uh, which is already in Plato, the, the, the necessary resistance to opinion right i mean when we hear you know people say everybody's entitled to their opinion so what right i mean <laughs> the truth is not a matter of, matter of entitlement right the truth right, right. is the truth i mean which is typically you know what socrates plato always say and that makes a lot of sense and this is something that uh, i mean people simply don't understand so yeah, I mean, uh, I mean whether then uh, philosophers should, I mean whether there should be kings to begin with. I mean, since that's the <laughs> metaphor, we, we can address that as well, right? Yeah, that that is the metaphor, or right. the, no, the, the central. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> right. Right. Cutting, the yeah, cutting <laughs> the throat. Yeah, cutting the throat of the king. Beheaded right. of the, Behead yeah. the king. Yeah, yeah. Oh boy, right. yeah. that doesn't that doesn't play this well with uh, Macron's France right now. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. another. Uh, Another tragedy that's turned into a state. Uh, you mean uh, the, yeah, that, that's that's a terrible situation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Josh, you wanted to say something or yeah? No, I'm sorry, I'm just okay. Okay, it's okay. No, 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 no problem. Um, um, uh, you wanted to? Yeah, yeah. Please, Eloy, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask yeah. something. Yeah, it's uh, it's about the 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 idea of the philosopher. Uh, yes. I don't know if, if I understood well. The idea is that uh, philosopher is a person. Can become any can any person can become a philosopher, right. but I think that one of the conditions, uh, if I understood well about you, is uh, love for knowledge, mm. love as a driving force, but love for knowledge, love for thought, right, and and, and going beyond uh, beyond on opinion. Mm -hmm. Now my question right. is, what are the social conditions that we can put into place? Uh, to develop the capacity, the, 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 the human capacity for uh, uh, to become a philosopher. Right. Uh, because this is, this is, I think, linked with the, with the horizon of, of, of communism, with the, right. the, the idea right. of emancipation, right? Yeah. I think, I, it, it, yeah. I, I, if I understood well, but you, he's not arguing that, you know, there should be kings as, as Plato, but rather that uh, the demos can become philosophers. We, we can become philosophers by, right. By uh, by by the by uh, cultivating love for knowledge, um, and so. But what are the social conditions as revolutionaries to create those con those uh, that situation right. in which we all can become philosophers there, that there we can book, book play a part in the governing and the in the creation of that new community that is called communism here. Right, right. Um, uh, and Matt put in the uh, to the chat a very good book. I, I actually have it near near me. I can show you. It's called. The I was thinking. Sorry, uh, Michael no, and, and Bruno. No, 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 no. I just I just recently, uh, you know, just last year started to to get in contact with you all and to attend some of your seminars. And I was precisely thinking in the role that like, uh, you know, the Institute for the Radical Imagination play on that. Is, is, is that, you know, when I remember I, the, first time, the first time I started to take this uh, uh, pre, uh, pre-Socratics classes and then uh, the, the, uh, attending this uh, seminar with uh, uh, Stanley, uh, Stanley Aronowitz, is, is that, like, I never felt a philosopher, but I, I I, I grasp stuff and I learn to think. Let's say, oh, 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 I, 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 I um, lost the fear and, and actually developed that passion for that drive for, for, um, for exploring ideas. Right, right. And, uh, and so, yeah, I was thinking that uh, the left could uh, become much more active in, in, in cultivating 
uh, taught knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Bruno. Yeah, no, if I may add, I mean, I hate yeah. to say that uh, traditionally, I, I mean, I never like even when I was a teenager, I started studying philosophy in Italy as a teenager in high school. The word philosopher, I, I always prefer the word thinker, even mm -hmm. to, to this day, you know, because uh, again, so that's so much for the philosopher king. So the, what is it to think, really? And then uh, the, this becomes really important. And this is something that, of course, uh, in uh, education, we always know, uh, do. But uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it is true that, uh, and this is also the lesson that we get from, uh, draw from Heidegger. I mean, um, usually we don't think. I mean, we are not really, right? And people don't think, we don't think very, very often. So the, the question is to really think and um, so, I mean, just, just uh, you know, just to <laughs> add this to the discussion, but we, we can go back to this, but it is... Uh... Well, I mean, you raise, a, you raise a good point because the closure, and this is well before Baju, 60 years before, is that Heidegger talks of the, the, uh, the end of philosophy, right. that we've reached the ends of philosophy, right, in a way, and that there is a particular closure and that we're working through, again, to me, Derrida never exceeded, you know, the Heideggerian project, even though he mm -hmm. took a lot of critical resources and may have taken it differently. But the ends of philosophy and that working through this whole aspect of metaphysics, right, and how we ended up. And in Heidegger's case, the, 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 the trajectory is from Plato to Nietzsche. That's where the closure is, yeah, yeah. right? The, that... the closure is this way. So there's a choice there between, you know, ideation you know, the true in Plato that, you know, I mean, I have to tell everybody, you know, Baju is not the first to take this on in terms of the truth and the true. Heidegger writes, you know, for nearly 400 pages on, you know, Plato's concept of the truth and the idea yeah. of the truth and all this. So this is a very difficult, I mean, this is, you know, this kind of thought and yeah, and the work practice. Was, so but, I, but, I think and, the, yeah. just uh, the, the short they say by Heidegger is the, the end of philosophy and the task uh, for yeah, thinking. Yeah, the task. The task thinking, thinking becomes a task. It's a labor in a certain way. Oh, God, it's, it's an active, active approach to thinking, a praxis, if you will, to go back. Yeah, it's really, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a task, task. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a task. Pass. And it's a like they craft is in is there certainly in the uh, is in the uh, in the in the Socratic dialogues techne of thinking. You know that's the craft analogy that is used throughout the Socratic uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know dialogue the Platonic dialogues. So so this becomes very interesting because Baju is well aware of this the anti-humanistic moment right as well the defeat of philosophical anthropology by the anti-humanist tradition or the a-humanist tradition, et cetera, the structural aspects of the structural Marxist approaches of the Althusserians where philosophy is just seen as effects in the world. You know, there's no such thing as a philosophy or having a philosophy. Philosophy produces effects in the world, right? Mm -hmm. This is really what it, what it, what it ends up doing. And it's and philosophy is always juxtaposed that to the ideological, you know, or you see science ideology, but philosophy, which can again, Heidegger says, and Althusser may follow in in this footstep, science does not think, it only does, and this is interesting in in some ways, you know, and and maybe Bruno, when we're finished, you'll write a treatise called Mathematics Does Not Think. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> alongside science, you know, because mm -hmm. Badiou really thinks thought is in mathematics, you know, as the ontological base of the thinking, where the nous, you know, begins, where the, the discovery of, of mind really is in this, this early, early, uh, you know, Greek thinking in some mm -hmm. ways, yeah, and where we're the product of this, and this is on the way to truth. So, I mean, to keep these things in mind, you know, Eloy's right. I mean, to get over the fear of thinking is really the first step, I think. Uh, you know, the left has not thought at all. The left is very good at critical, you know, thinking in, in terms of, I mean, critical thinking in terms of the critique, right, that, that is happening out there. 
and they have their formulaic approaches, right? You can read this in terms of surplus value, or you can read this in terms of, you know, uh, rates of exploitation, or you can read this as commodity fetishism. All these categories are there already, but is that real thinking, right? That, that, that's, the, that's the question, right? Or does this become just another kind of table of categories? Mm -hmm. this, this, this would be an interesting, you know, moment or something to, you know, for us to dwell, you know, on for a while. Is this kind of a limitation, if you, if you, if you will? Yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah no, I want yeah. to say that one of the best uh, moments for me, one of the things I like most in, uh, in uh, Marx uh, is uh, very much related to what we are talking about now is the, the, the the, the, the idea of the emancipation of the senses, uh, we spoke about that often, yeah. right? Uh, which is uh, really uh, the problematization of this uh, question of uh, the, the relationship between uh, theory and practice and so on. It is uh, when uh, there is this uh, uh, coming together of, uh, right? I mean, uh, the, 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 the senses themselves become theoreticians in their own praxis. That's right. what it says. Uh, in uh, the Paris manuscripts, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, in uh, yeah, 1844, yeah. 26 years old. Yeah, you said that, yeah. yeah. 1844, right, especially it's uh, in uh, the section on uh, private property and the uh, yeah. communism, uh, yeah. right? In uh, yeah. the third uh, manuscript. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Absolutely. Really. wonderful. Yeah. The emancipation of the senses, and as Bruno says, the theoretician, the senses as theoreticians, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Very, very yeah. interesting. Immediately in their practice, yes. Yeah, and, yeah. and remember too, what we're dealing with here in Plato, and I want to, I want to point this out. This is a theory of light, and this is a theory of sight that's going on. It's not hearing, you know, hearing mm -hmm. is there in the musical, but it's really the idos as sight, right? The history of Western philosophy is built on sight, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <It's, laughs> It really is. I mean, this is, you have to think about this very actively. Almost in every major philosophy, the I, you know, the EYE or the interior insight, all of these things are the third eye, you know, it's all pr privileged out of the Platonic tradition, many, many ways, you know, anyway. So how does we destroy this? And Heidegger is the first to say we don't hear, right? We, we don't hear. The hearing becomes the chief sense in a way. For Marx, it's all the senses, which is part of his beauty. Marcuse, the man who is, in my opinion, more for Bakian in terms of sensuous rationality than he is Marxist in some ways. He's certainly not mature Marxist. He's early, maybe sensuous uh, rationality. Yeah. What were you going to say, Bruno? I'm sorry. I'm no, 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 no. Okay. I was, I was yeah. Just saying, yes. yeah. So, so th this is again very important. And that kind of closure that we go through that Heidegger speaks about, you know, one way of taking it is exactly what Bruno cited, you know, maybe the task at one level is we become theoreticians, the senses as theoreticians of the future, right, <laughs> in a way, you know, of a, of a of future praxis could be interesting. And this would be satisfied if you want to think about um, Badiou again, in this context, the art and the love aspects of his conditions for philosophy or his conditions for thought if we want to relanguage mm. that you know and i was going to mention a friend of ours richard uh, um uh, opaski uh, gilman opaski has a book coming out called love and communism i haven't seen it uh, i i kind of have a sense of it but you know when it comes out i'll let you know i think it's due in another month or two but he's going to take on this aspect as, as eloy was saying what, what role does love play for us going forward? How do we bring people, you know, yeah, to this kind of love of the world again, love of the subject matter, love of the, you know, transformation? Yeah, in, in, in a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Communism of love or is it love and communism? The, the book is, I think, love and communism, no? Or is it communism of love? You don't know? Okay, I, I don't have it. I mean, I may be, I may be mis, uh, misappropriating the title. I'm sorry. No, I, I don't know. I say, yeah. I, 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 th I think it is communism of love, but okay. uh, you know, okay. I may be mistaken. Well, that's better that. for yeah. you, boy. I thought communism and love. I, I no, like no, the, no. Uh, I like the conjunction. But anyway, Richard Opaski Gilman. Yeah. 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 
but uh, communism love inquiry okay love and communism yeah that's the title love and communism oh it, oh, it is love and communism yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's really good at this we have to i'm thank gonna, I'm gonna take yeah. a look at it, it looks an inquiry good. into the poverty of exchange value ah amazing. okay <laughs> oh wow that's political economy. yeah yeah wow. yeah there we go <laughs> yes we, we we get something in terms of concrete uh yeah but it, practice here it is the the communism of love that's the title i mean i went to the link right the communism of love okay right, right. ah the communism of the yeah yeah which is beautiful yeah nice title but I, but in any case, I, I mean, because I, we were speaking, you know, well, one more thing that I made. Of where, where he's going here after being very well aware of the end of philosophy and the task of thinking. You know, these conditions are all, I think, in some ways, uh, absolutely necessary for us to do philosophy. This is what he's saying, right? And, you know, he wrote a book, and a book uh, on love about you. You know, he's done some aesthetics, yeah. right? He's, he, I mean, it's, you know, it's not like he just dreams this up. He's writing about it in different forms, right? He has a, the, the meta politics. He has ethics, the, me, the book on ethics as well, which is a branch. If you're an Aristotelian, politics is the master science and ethics is a part of that, eth, you know, that master science. So it's the politico ethical horizon of our times maybe another way of looking at politics as thought, you know, through ethos. Yeah. And, you know, again, you know, love and communism or the communism of love, right? Or something. I, like yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I read in praise of love by, by you. Yeah. It was uh, the, actually the very first book I, I read uh, from him. Okay. And I think it's a fantastic piece. It's a very, it has, it's a short one, yes. but it's a very, very powerful. Yeah. He says right. that, um, what uh, uh, the driving force of, of a revolutionary is precisely the love uh, of life, of what is there, and the rage that emerged when you see that all what is there is is suffocated by capital, Absolutely. by the relations uh, of domination that emerge in this system, and therefore he said our uh, dialectic is a is a positive dialectic rather than a negative one. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I feel very much shown. more interesting than Adorno in a way. It's much more open ended in a sense that it's much more futurally based. For Adorno, yeah. there's a kind of closure in the negative dialectics mm -hmm. to think of it that way, even though, you know, you, Adorno wants to break through in the negative dialectics to get to that positivity. Exactly. But it, it, Adorno he says, never really yeah. privileges that moment. You know, the, the working of Adorno is to bust through the subject again right <laughs> after all the objectivity is, 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 is spoken to through the labor of the negative in the hegelian sense yeah i mean you know there's a lot of hard work here i mean you know to get you know he, he wants to get to this kind of you know positive subjectivity but you're right about but you in a way is really developing trying to develop a positive dialectic around love art right and again, even mathematics, we, we maybe can talk about that. Yeah, see what, the, what, what that yields. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Bernard. No, yeah. no, if I may, because yeah. you mentioned the ethics, which is actually the book okay. by Badiou yeah. that I yeah. really yeah. like, yeah. which is the yeah. subtitle is uh, An Essay on uh, the Understanding of Evil. Right. I just uh, opened one page, uh, and uh, it is interesting because uh, it, offer, it gives, uh, provides uh, a sense of this, uh, uh, his ontology and mathematics yeah. in that sense, right. because right. Uh, perhaps I already understand, but I, I'm reading this from page 128, right. when he says, uh, you know, that uh, he speaks of the essence of uh, ontology as I conceive it, uh, which is, uh, it is to be beneath, beneath the distinction of the real and the possible. So it is right. something really uh, um, very much foundational in that sense. Uh, that probably this mathematics is beneath uh, no? the distinction of the real and the past. It's very interesting. And uh, so, and then at, at one point he speaks of the border of the mathematical, the border of mathematics. So, right. I, mean, I mean, certainly the, the use 
he makes all that mathematics is certainly not of uh, the common you know, way in which we no, no, of course think not. Of even the position, right, yeah. As I mentioned, uh, Laudman, part of the, the, the discourse there, and Badiou is speaking at this level too, is with Albert Laudman, who writes on the real, the mathematical real. This is part of his discourse. You know, the, mm -hmm. the French have this very long tradition going back to Pierre Duhamp of, you know, the, the who wrote German science and did mathematics, you know, and of course, look, look at their tradition. You have Descartes, right? The inventor of analytical geometry. Most French people who go to school are educated out of an analytical model, not a synthetic model. So he's always, you know, thinking that way in terms of, a, uh, of, of, uh, of um, you know, the mathematical. You know, this is what they're trained in, the Cartesian method, right? right? Although, yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. No, if I may, since you know, Descartes, and at the same time, of course, we have, uh, on the other hand, another scientist, and uh, Gion and Pascal, right? Pascal, yeah. who precisely speaks of uh, uh, the reason of the heart, right? The heart has reasons that not even know reason understands, right? So it's a complete synthetic rather than analytic, but uh, still uh, uh, based in uh, science uh, as well, right? I, I mean, and, and maybe if I may, because we were speaking about these things. Both were mathematicians though. Yeah, yeah. Remember this, I mean, this is very important in terms of the advent of philosophical modernity. And for those of you that, I mean, I'm maybe, you know, in philosophy, modernity is sort of dated with the Cartesian moment. For other people, maybe Martin Luther in terms of subjectivity. But Descartes really is the inaugurator, if you will, of modern, you know, philosophy, or is what philosophers consider modernity. If Sartre thinks Madame Bovary is the origin <laughs> of modernist literature, you know, to philosophers, it really goes back to René Descartes. And then, of course, the conversation with Pascal, right? And, of course, then the argument against uh, Descartes in terms of Vico in, in Italy, you know, was another, another aspect of this. Right, but yeah, yeah, but go, yeah. please go ahead, Bruno. So, yeah, and they were both mathematicians, both, yeah, yeah. as well as Bacon, you know, uh, Francis Bacon in England, mm -hmm. who is really the first of the scientific project. I mean, this he's the founder of English imperialism. If you really want to think yeah. this through in terms of ideation, it's Bacon's, uh, you know, Novum Organum, which really is the new world, it is the beginning mm -hmm. of. of uh, Imperialism, if you will, yeah. Imperialism, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. No, basically, this uh, and uh, certainly the, this is because we were speaking about, and this seems to be central in uh, uh, Badiou's um, project as well, and uh, the question of the relationship here between uh, not thinking and uh, um, and uh, and acting, the yeah. and practice, yeah. and. Uh, so it goes back, one may even say that the question of the, the, the senses, uh, the quote that I mentioned by Marx, and the body, therefore, by the body, we said, the, 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 not the question of, um, so that, that, that's, that's uh, an open, I, I was thinking now, even in the tradition of uh, phenomenology, right? I mean, we mentioned Heidegger, but uh, in other tradition, tradition of um, the study uh, of the body, you know, like uh, Sartre on the one right. hand, but Marleau-Ponty uh, right. as well, right? I mean, uh, right. which is really this effort to rethink, right? To ground uh, thinking in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the body. I mean, uh, in a very material, materialistic way, right? I mean, I think it's uh, not that famous, uh, uh, illustration by Marlo Punti when when I write right it's not that I use my hand to write but I am uh, my hand uh, writing I become right, right, the right, hand right. writing right so right. it is again uh, the doing of uh, uh, so no I mean I was is, the, the only thing is with but you again uh, the, the, the 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 interesting thing is the place of this. Uh, um, Right, M mathematical ground, uh, right, which uh, in this meta type of uh, even politics, you know, this meta level, which perhaps uh, is uh, a bit difficult to explain. Yes, it is very difficult. And also, you know, remember that Badiou is, 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 
you know, again, I mean, and again, I'm not an expert in this and nor do I have the uh, capacity to really judge, but if you're talking about Rhineman fields, you know, you're talking about Mobius strips, you're talking about, you know, all kinds of mathematical set theory, Lautman's investigation into the physical real and the mathematics involved there. So all of these things are operative in his thinking. But again, he sees this grounded, if you will, in the Platonic universe and in, in, in Plato, that this is the, the problem that we've gotten away. For him, you know, if I can re-language like Heidegger, we have forgotten, you know, we have forgotten Plato. You know, <laughs> you know, we must come back to the meaning of Plato. This is basically what Badiou is doing in terms of reorienting us to Plato. Right, because he sees Plato as a way of thinking outside the impasse where we've been faced, the closure of Western metaphysics. Right, the Nietzschean nihilism. Even though he'll agree that Nietzsche, you know, has you know great profound things to say about about this. Right, the Heideggerian restructure and rewriting of ontology. These are some of his antagonists. Right, the Popperian universe of both Plato and Marx are totalitarian thinking. He's going against that as well. He's trying to make Plato into a much more open-ended, as well as Marx, you know, who, you know, some people thought were totalitarian because of the way he was taken up and, you know, quote unquote, used as a, as a, you know, an icon of, you know, bureaucratic, uh, if you will, socialism, if you will, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, if I may, uh, that's, as long as we keep that perspective, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, that's very interesting because, I mean, uh, precisely since you mentioned Nietzsche, but uh, as uh, Heidegger now explains very well in the four volume uh, lectures on Nietzsche, right? I mean, Nietzsche equates uh, metaphysics with Platonism, right? I mean, yes, metaphysics or Nietzsche is uh, the philosophy coming from Plato and the Judeo Christian tradition combined. Right, and uh, so in Heidegger's test, uh, Nietzsche does not overcome it, only brings it to completion, right? So then uh, in Badiou, we have precisely the, almost like a, an opposite uh, movement. I mean, he goes in the other direction and yeah. uh, rescues, yeah. tries to rescue Plato from that. Uh, yeah, no, there's an uh, obviously yeah. a dialectical reversal, complete dialectical reversal of the Heideggerian moment in terms of the closure, as well as Marx, you know, who really dismissed Plato and Plato's Republic as mm -hmm. the projection, idealized projection of the Egyptian caste system. I mean, anybody that's interested in this, there's a very good uh, book and all of you about this new stuff of Isabel Wilkerson, you know, on, on caste versus race. This is another thing that's coming up now in terms of the new trend, the new tendency. Don't think in terms of race, think in terms of caste. And, you know, mm -hmm. Marx was, you know, and then, of course, Louis Dumont, homo hierarchus, right, is, mm -hmm. is another aspect of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, Eloy, thank you. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, we'll see you soon. I hope in Montreal soon. soon. Yeah, okay. Um, I, hope, I, hope, yeah, I hope so. I really hope so. It was a beautiful session, yeah. but I have to leave. Yes. Yeah, no, no, no. Problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, going back to this, I mean, this is a massive, I mean, it's a violent act, as you know, it's a violent dialectical reversal and say, look, he's saying, we, you know, the, the proposition here is we have misread Plato for the mm -hmm. last, uh, you know, 100 years, right? We have misappropriated Hegel. For 100, I mean, excuse me, Plato for the last 150 years. This is what Badiou's saying. Yeah, yeah. And there's and a massive we... misappropriation going on here. Yeah. And then yeah. steals to lose is also part of that misappropriation, even though he doesn't take it the way of Marx or Heidegger, right? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, no, if I may also... say, maybe. The, the, maybe this clarifies uh, precisely the question about the place of uh, mathematics uh, as an ontology. I mean, because in, in other words, I mean, I, in a simplistic way, he said, no, no, yeah. I mean, it's not that Plato is the idealist uh, that, uh, you know, people think of uh, from uh, especially the materialist tradition, I dismiss Plato altogether because uh, it's not a question of ideas as such ideas in the no, most, uh, no, no. but it is uh, actually the mathematical foundation of uh, which is, uh, you know, comes before uh, even the distinction of the real and the potential. Right. And, so and if, you, yeah. if you think about this, look at the structure of the book here, 
the dialogues, how he rewrites Plato, he will say, what is an idea? There's a whole dialogue mm -hmm. about yeah. what is an idea before we get to the mathematical, yeah, right. to the dialectic. You know, the, the, the dialectic is predicated on the movement of ideation to the mathematical ontology, then to the reason, the reason of the dialectic. I mean, the, the logos itself mm -hmm. is the dialectic in, in many ways. You know, this is, this is it. The dialectic that mm -hmm. is at the top, you know, of the, of the, um, of the um, ascension, if you will, uh, the ascension, right, in Plato and how, how you read this, you know, in, in a way. So, yes, I mean, this is very, very important to, to take in mind. You know, and as you know, I mean, in the philosophical tradition, there's a lot of talk about what is an idea, right? We have this in Descartes. We have this about perfection and the ontological proof for the existence of God. We have the idea in, in uh, you know, um, uh, certainly in, um, in Hegel. We have it all, always, right? And and really, in a sense, and certainly in 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 uh, all in psychoanalysis and in in therapeutic encounters, yeah, yeah. I mean, our you know the the idea of the transitional object in psychoanalysis. Yeah. You know, why does Cezanne Cezanne, who is a completely violent person, nothing but trouble with his friend Emile Zola, paint still lights so beautifully? <laughs> what is going on here? You know, in a sense of the sublimation, you know, to think about this, how this is ideated is very, very important. And we, we forget that we forget the idea and then the concept. And in a way, this is the problem in philosophy departments and in education. There should be courses for the freshmen or the second year students or whatever, uh, maybe even beginning in the high school on concepts, ideas and methods. This is this would be crucial. You know, to ask these questions, how do we get to where we're getting going? This, to me, would be more utopic, right, in, in project than sitting around and saying, oh, I'm going to teach a course about, you know, the contemporary uh, race problem or the contemporary, you know, you know, you know what I mean? At least as a starting point, because then you have a concept. When did race come about? You know, I mean, Foucault has a beautiful piece. I don't think it's in English on the invention of race. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then that concept, and then Tom Modern, back in the before his death, you know, he, he went there in many ways. Yeah, and as I say, now we have this debate between race and caste, you know, with mm -hmm. uh, you know this. Uh, I think her name, first name is Isabel. You, you know this work. I mean, it's it's taken hold in in some circles. You know this. Uh, you know, let's let's talk about caste instead of race. You know, the caste systems that are operative in, instead of the race question. You know. This is a deflection, in my opinion, but you know. Anyway, maybe we can do. It. Yeah, Isabel Wilkinson is in the in the chat. So uh, yeah. So I mean, I I I I you know I I hear what you're saying. The real and the you know uh, and that passage right from the possibility to the real and the mathematical is located there. Then there's a border, and we can talk about those borders and etc. And I don't think anybody, if anybody in this room is capable of you know merging set theory with Ryman, uh, you know, curves, you know, et cetera, <laughs> and all these things, more power to you. And please tell me about, about you, but this is something that, you know, or Cantor's, uh, you know, thinking and, you know, and remember, I, I want to say this, Husserl phenomenology began with mathematics. This is where, you know, Husserl began, you know, I mean, the ontology was, yes, the manifold senses of the word being, right? In Brentano, and by the way, the, both Husserl and Freud were in the same class, which is interesting, you know. And then the joke is that they were listening to Brentano a lot talk about the several senses of the word being, and that Freud took it down to the basement or an underground, and Husserl took it, you know, up the transcendental. So we had the transcendental and the, you know, the the, the archaeological, the dig going on at once. So it's kind of interesting that they were in that same class because that, you know, very, very crucial moment, uh, you know, in terms of the history of thinking, you know, one develops consciousness and intentionality, the other develops, you know, the unconscious, right, in a sense, you know, this is the, this is the bedrock, if you will, besides, you know, castration, anxiety needs, you know, the unconscious has to be there. Uh, so um, anyway, um, yeah, I mean, again, 
the 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 the, the, the I, I, again i'm not trying to say i agree with about you i mean i'm much more comfortable reading mallarmé and rambo than i am going to pull off a book from my shelf on george Cantor's mathematics this is not my thing right so but but at the same time he is really again trying to build this for some reason right some reason and why does it become one of the conditions for philosophy going forward yeah 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 i mean you know alongside love art you know and and politics these are the four conditions that he's always thinking through and has written books on this he wrote a book on cinema too it's not that good his book on uh, on uh, wagner is not that good adorno's light years ahead of him in, in search of wagner in the book he wrote on Wagner, and the Wagner. So yeah, not really that good, but but yeah, and the book on cinema is not that good. Ron Sierra is very good on cinema, in my opinion. Yeah, very good. It's not that bad. Okay, well. I think it's, he calls it a philosophical experimentation. Okay. It's kind of interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's not great, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's have it right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Beryl. Nice to see you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Enjoy, you enjoy your day. Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, you know, any other thoughts? I mean, uh, yeah, Jerome, it was good to hear you tonight. Uh, you know, any thoughts about where we're trying to take this or what we're, we're going on? I mean, I know it's, you know, a kind of smorgasbord at times. Or, uh, well, yeah. the yeah. one thing that I was thinking of is because uh, yeah. I come more from the literary world. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, uh, there's there was this in creative writing classes, there was the mantra at one time uh, was something from William Carlos Williams that was no ideas but in things. And when you think about this, it's a perfect example of commodity fetishism. Uh, and you kind of welcome bad you to say, let's bring the things, let's bring the ideas back in because what you got was a lot of poetry with tons of things and no ideas. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. No, it's a good comment. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 The thing is, used to be the uh, slogan in the '80s and the early '90s. Everybody would speak, pre pre you know, preface their. The thing is, right? <laughs> That's what's happening. The thing is, so and so, what happened, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So um, yeah, I mean, anything else about the the, the chapter? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I personally like this very much because I think he brings up you know attributes of what is a philosopher. You know, besides you know just a professor who reads and interprets texts and then maybe writes you know about life or about uh, you know objects in the world or domains of objects. I like the way he talks about this. And you know, on on page uh, one sixty eight, I think there's an interesting distinction. Uh, you know, that's uh, very psychoanalytically directed. You know, these are objects of desire, uh, drive, not desire. And desire isn't love. The fact that the object is a part object in no way precludes that it's the whole underpinning, the partialness, the desire and love are ultimately related to. But think about your own experience instead, you boys and girls who roam the world spurred on by desire. As experts in love, you ought to know everything about a young man, for example, that moves and attracts anyone who has an erotic temperament, regardless of their gender, and convinces him that such an object as a whole is worthy of his attention and affection. Isn't that the way you behave with good-looking boys, my dear Quibblers? Partial flaws in no way keep you from falling for the young man as whole. So he has a snub nose. You say it looks sensitive and charming. If he has a hook nose, you say it looks regal like an eagle's beak, imperial. And if his nose is neither snub nor hook and attracts no one's attention, it means the young heartthrob is perfectly proportioned. If the young Adonis's skin is tanned by the sun, you'd say it's as manly, etc. He goes on washed out complexion, a honey bun. But if you want to use me as a professional seducer, said Lacan further down, I accept, but only for the sake of moving our discussion forward. Okay, so hypocrite, it says, Amantha, you know sex is all you think about. Let's change the subject. Then they go about the drunk. Okay, so what, what's happening here is really, he's again, trying to distinguish between the logic of desire versus drive, 
right? All men desire to know, Aristotle. That is a philosophical proposition. That begins, Thama design, the wonder, you know, if I pronounce that correctly. You know, that philosophy begins in wonder, in amazement about things existing at all. You know, and this, this, this is Aristotle in the, in the beginning. The, the desire is there. But then the drive, you know, sometimes takes over, right? So he's really talking about one of his conditions here, the difference between love and desire. So anyway, um, he, he goes on further that the, the say, the say, the, the, the philosopher really desires the totality or the whole is what Badiou's point ultimately is, or what Socrates' point in this discussion. On the next page, 169, if I say a philosopher is someone who desires wisdom, it won't be a matter of a choice between different parts of that wisdom, but the whole form of wisdom, right? Of, of wisdom, right? Let's examine a young person, a girl, a boy who doesn't let possess the principles with which to distinguish what's important and what's worthless. Let us assume that he or she has no liking for theoretical knowledge. We wouldn't call him or her a scientist or a philosopher anymore that we refer to someone who has no liking for food as having big appetite or as famished or as a food lover. Anorexic would be more like it. But when you see a young person who wants to taste every branch of learning, who's obviously attracted to knowledge and insatiably devoted to it, wouldn't he or she deserve to be called a philosopher? There are lots of people who fit your definition, people you wouldn't expect. The lovers of mainstream movies, their enthusiasm, Hollywood blockbusters. So he's playing on this question of desire, right, in a sense, which the, he will then take apart later in, you know, the, the passion, right, for the truth, right? The, the truth is much more important than this kind of just passion for the entertainment or the knowledge to know the blockbuster film or what's going on. Or my, my friend that wrote a book on the birth of the binge, right? The people are binging during COVID on all, every movie they can get their hands up. For Baju, this is not being the philosopher. This is not, this is a drive, not a desire, right? So anyway, um, th then he goes through the level of uh, enjoyment, right? Uh, uh, Page 171, the lovers of show, concerts, paintings, sports competitions, all enjoy a soprano's pianissimo high note, a cello's vibrato, the delicacy of the sketch, the opulence of the color, a beautiful athletic body and motion, anything finely wrought or appealing and whatever is offered to their sensory factor. But this empirical experience doesn't enable their minds to in, in, understand thought's real purpose. So Bruno, maybe we can go back to this in terms of the sensory as well, right? Later, you know, and the, and the emancipation of the senses. But someone could object to you, what difference does it make since they have enjoyment? Enjoyment, perhaps, and I don't know if the word jouissance is used here. I have to, I, my French copy, unfortunately, is not in, in, in New York. But anyway, I, I will check if I get there. But life, dear friend, the true life that Rambo speaks of, the life he says that is absent, and that's from, you know, season in hell, by the way. Do they have that true life? Imagine that someone accepts the existence of beautiful things, but can't accept that the being beautiful of these things exists as the aim and outcome of a process of thought. Suppose that the same someone is unable to follow a friend who's involved in that process and who offers in a brotherly spirit to take him with him all the way to the end, therefore transforming his empirical opinion into rational thought. Do you think that that someone is living the true life fully awake or don't you think that his life is but a dream? It's not, it's, it's not that easy, objected or not. To distinguish dreams from reality is Shakespeare in Hamlet, Calderon, in Life is a Dream, in Pirandello, and a little of everything he wrote. Careful, you mentioned three playwrights. Three people that are about life acting out, the performative, right? Amantha thought, okay, it's thinking that something that's like something else isn't merely a likeness of it, but the thing itself. Here we are back to mimesis, too. You know, does the philosopher cut through 
again, the imitation, right? Or the mimesis too, okay? So this is very, very important. Precisely, right? And therefore, an anti-dreamer is someone who accepts the existence of the being beautiful self. Someone's capable of contemplating the essential beauty that accounts for the fact that things that participate in it are called beautiful. Someone who doesn't confuse beautiful things that exist with their being beautiful or the being beautiful with existing things, which, since they're beautiful, participate in that being. Wouldn't we say that about an anti-dreamer that he's full living, fully awake and is not lost, lost in dream? Yes, he could be easily a poet, doesn't Maller May say, and he quotes Maller May, the true poet's broad and humble gesture must keep them from dreams, so the enemies of his trust. Okay, let's accept that combination, said Socrates, and I say the anti-dreamer's mind, as far as it knows the being of what exists, de deserves the name of pure thought, right? Whereas to the dreamer's mind, insofar as it's limited only to the existence of what appears, will give the name opinion. So you see how Baju works here. I mean, he's really trying to show that the logic of appearance builds. You know, these people in the cave, if you will, are really building towards the, the opinion, right? In a sense. And it is the anti dream. And remember that Socrates, the passage we read on the noble lie, was about the dream right? We will give them a dream. We will tell them the dream, which becomes the noble lie. This is very interesting in yeah. terms of the dream and the anti-dreamer. Yeah, Bruno, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I just want to say, I, I really like uh, this uh, universalism, no? Yeah. And, um, but you, and uh, it might be interesting <laughs> to compare, you know, this illustration of the beautiful with uh, uh, the one in the Fedo. Right, right. The, the dialogue when uh, then Socrates dies, which is uh, in the Fedo, it's uh, 100 uh, B uh, to one, 101, to right. 100 right. B, 100 right. E. It's wonderful, right? When uh, uh, Socrates says, uh, right, I Thank mean, you, uh, Jerome. beautiful. Have a good night. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I just replied to the chat. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That uh, if I may read just two lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, I mean, the if, Fedo's if, a good piece. From yeah. The, yeah. If there is anything beautiful besides the beautiful itself, it is beautiful for no other reason than uh, that uh, it shares in that beautiful. And I say this uh, of everything, right? Right. Be, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's, that's a great moment in the yeah. Fedo. I, and it is this. Uh, so, I mean, perhaps. I mean, at least I personally understand more this mathematical kind of grammar, almost a structure and supporting mm -hmm. right, uh, the, this uh, universalism, which is interesting because it seems to me he's trying to do this uh, by at the same time saving things such as uh, love, desire and so on, right? I mean, right. so it's not simply a... Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, just the yeah. cold, icy, rational... Yeah. Thought of the mathematical, yes, exactly. and, and, yeah. and you know the being of the beautiful. Uh, I think one of Richard's Seth Bernadetti actually did many commentaries right on this uh, on the being of the beautiful. Um, you know, in in the Platonic, uh, yeah, yeah. Are you on crutches? Are those crutches behind you? No, no that's an art. That's from a, a a short film I made. Oh, okay, okay. I'm just wondering. <laughs> You're all right. I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you for thank you for your concern. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I thought they were crutches in some ways behind you to get out of the chair. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, Bernadette, the Straussians are very interested in this passage, right? In the Thedo yes. that that, uh, that uh, Bruno just read from. You know, the being in the beautiful, et cetera, right? And and uh, you know, that's another notion. What is what is the beautiful, you know, in a sense? What is the birth? You know, aesthetics really literally means sense perception, right? In Greek, it's really the our sense perception. Yes. The aesthetic world is not just the study of beauty, it's the study of the senses and how we perceive through the senses, you know, and this is of course, you know, what phenomenology takes off on, you know, completely is the is perception, right? I mean, the primacy of perception, one of Marlo Ponti's great books and the phenomenology of perception. 
So th this becomes, again, uh, very, very interesting for the rereading of Plato, too. <laughs> yeah. I'm having trouble reconciling that um, yep. Yep. perception and aesthetics with thought and, um, and beauty, right? The essence of beauty and wholeness and desire and love as opposed to drive whole objects as opposed to part objects. It's not adding up. There's, there's some okay. missing here. And yep. especially if you're doing a, a, a materialist reading of Plato, right? So right. I feel like we right. need to be a little more responsible about, about these terms. And uh, maybe I should go back. Maybe I should go back to it. Okay, what well, I mean, what, what, okay, what, just what this passage again. Yeah, in, do you have in mind? It, it's what we it's what you were just reading um uh, starting with um the the beautiful youth right so you start with the beautiful youth and you lose sight of the whole when you're looking at just the nose right you know you you'll ignore you'll ignore the flaws if you are in love with the full if you're desiring of the full right, right. person the right whole, yeah. hmm? and um this just isn't making it's it's just not adding up. So so the 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 image, the beautiful image of the youth is also uh, a part object. That's not the that's not the fullness of the youth. That's not a person, that's not that's not a that's not a whole object, actually. It's just the appearance of an object. So um it's it's sort of improperly applying a, a distinction maybe in a Lacanian way, uh, between drive and desire, uh, part and whole. And, um, and I, it's, it's, it's just throwing me off. I, I, I'm not getting right. it. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think he's saying, I mean, about the youth, he's trying to deal with the whole, right? That somehow desire, uh, uh, you know, is not distinguishing, quote, the the crooked nose from this kind of nose, or it's not relevant to the whole. So the partial thing is not not you know, the, or the part object is not not taken up as as a, a you know a determining a, a determinant to the whole, right? He's, it he's also has nothing to do with desire yeah. um, in yeah. a in the Lacanian sense. So right, um, it's it's confusing this little bit. It's lovely, but uh, yeah, 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 I understand. I mean, I think he's dealing with the uh, with the. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I think he's also, I mean, dealing here with. I think you, you you hit upon a key term: the image, right? The image of the thing, or the image of the of the the object, right? In some ways, uh, that we really haven't crossed that, that line yet. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, we haven't really crossed the line into. The logic of reality yet, right? Yes. Abstracted enough. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, please. No, I'm just going to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, in Greek, the uh, kalos means both uh, uh, the good and the beautiful. Right. Together. So yeah. in yeah, so in Greek, there's a kind of of uh, uh, to beauty has a has another sense, which is of, of a kind of, you know, I, I always love in modern Greek, we say stokalo, which means towards the, you know, what? Towards the good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. towards the good. good. For the good, of, good for the good. So, right, stokalo. And, and, and in an ancient Greek, in a sense, that would mean also towards the beautiful. Um, you know, there's a, there's a sense that the beautiful and the good uh, are, are, uh, have this uh, deep essential connection. Um, so I think that's also uh, at work in, in Plato in a way. Um, I have to, I, by chance, I, uh, I'll say a, a few, I saw uh, a friend of mine from Brazil gave a talk on the language of Bolsonaro and, and Nazism and mentioned a film I had not seen called uh, uh, the, uh, the Architecture of Doom by Peter Green, which is kind of on 
made in, I think, 1991 on, uh, on the Nazis, kind of like how many of the uh, Nazi leaders had a, had a uh, were kind of would-be artists and had, with, a real, with a real hatred of modernism and such, and, but had this whole project around beauty, which is quite sinister in a way. Um, in, in, in which they connected to um, in their own strange way with ancient Greece. Um, but in any case, yes, so uh, I just wanted to contribute that, that, that in terms of this, you know, how do we move from the good to the beautiful? Uh, in, in Greek, it's got a very, uh, uh, very connected. Yeah. I mean, I think Lydia really brings up something very, very um, profound here, the distinction between drive and desire, which is all over the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis. And certainly, I mean, Badiou is using this here. And what would be the difference between the drive and that deconstruction of that drive and then desire uh, as well in this, in this movement towards the whole? that, that uh, Baidu is trying to pull off here, you know, in, in questions of love, right? First of mm -hmm. all, it first begins there. Uh, so I, I don't know if I'm articulating this in terms of your problem with this, or it doesn't add up uh, or something, but I mean, it seems to me that that's where this is coming from, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the you, know, uh, you know, what is the dis distinction between the, 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 the desire, right? And and the and the drive, right? What is what is really going on here in terms of Baju? What is he trying to do in terms of philosophy, right? Is they both they both seem to pertain to part objects, is sort of my right. point. And I and even okay. the whole the whole object that he presents is imagistic, yeah, um, okay. and fant fantasied and and not actually um, whole. So okay. it, it's, I'm I'm confused about the okay. references. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, again, I, I think he's thinking of philosophy, again, as a totality. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, he's thinking of this as a, a totality, the, the role of the philosopher, what is a philosopher, is a totality, rather than just a, a, a part of a, of a discipline, or just the drive for knowledge or the desire. For knowledge in the I think original. I get that, but I think it's creepy and just the way that Richard okay. was saying about uh, beauty and goodness being conflated, uh, it's creepy. Okay. Uh, when 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 a wholeness has a, an aesthetic presentation, um, that freaks me out. Okay. Right? That that's um, all kinds of. Um, you know, that's all kinds of, of, of uh, eugenics, you know, I mean, it's, um, oh, I see. it's just, um, it's really, uh, that's not the kind of totality that I want for philosophy, I guess. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. I think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good, good, good question uh, where we're going, but remember, these are the folks that bring you goddesses such as Aphrodite etc this is a sinister you know culture and at the same time full of thought together right i mean I these, are, these are myth makers you know in, in a certain way i think you see about Badiou embracing yeah. this for uh -huh. uh, for for communist love i mean i'm i'm a little confused about that like how right. is this actually going to work in a materialist economy how how are these how are how are sense perceptions actually going to work out in that regard Right. Well, this will be the next book, right? How does it work out in terms of the, the political economy? This is this is the philosophy. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get to some of this later, though. We will see in poetry and thought. I mean, hopefully by the time I mean we can spend you know an extra week, you know, going over the whole book, if you will, right? I mean, the whole attempt to re reconfigure and recast. Platonic democratic materialism, right? What, he, what he's really trying to say here. I mean, I think it, it, it it's necessitated because we're going to have a whole section on poetry and thought, justice and happiness, which get more into the materialistic premises, right? Uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. 
uh, yeah. Um, so, um, um, yeah, I mean, let's hold it open. I mean, I, I just was, I was thinking when you said, you know, the, the, the desire and drive, I was thinking of, you know, Lacan for fundamental, you know, uh, concepts of uh, psychoanalysis, you know, drive is, is very important in that, in that, uh, that work uh, there. And he's obviously playing on this where he uses drive and desire at the same time. And he uses partial and uh, whole objects too, the part object, you know, in some ways, you know, that we can uh, also use as, uh, you know, psychoanalytic uh, uh, terms. But I mean, Badiou as a strange, again, uh, you know, he, he, he calls uh, Lacan the anti-philosopher. So he has a whole, a whole series of lectures that have just come out in English, by the way. Uh, so, uh, you know, if people are interested, uh, it's now out from Columbia Press, from uh, Columbia University. So he, he gave these lectures. So it's a, a, an ongoing relationship with psychoanalysis here too at stake. So I'll, I'll try to reread it. I mean, you raised, I think, a very, very good uh, a, a question here too uh, about uh, the, you know, the communist love. You know, or what does that mean? Love and you know the communism of love, or love and communism. You know, is is, is I think a very crucial question. And uh, you know, where do we go with this? You know, uh, yeah, yeah. In a way, I mean, you know, it used to be, you know, if you if uh, you know you were interested in someone's girlfriend, the argument used to be, you know, women are not private property. You know, I want to take her out or something like that. This was a, you know, a glib way of approaching this back in the day, right? <laughs> in some ways, you know, and maybe on the other side too. So this, this, is, this was also uh, thrown out. But anyway, let's let, let's keep it open. Any thoughts, anybody else about this? I mean, Richard's right though. The the Calon is also about the beautiful. You know, Ormofi, You know, which you say someone's really beautiful. Or vivacious, or over in the in the modern Greek, is a play on that kalos and kalon, you know, the good, you know, from the ancient, you know, uh, you know, you know, oreo, right, <laughs> you know, ex right. excellence, all these things kind of come out of this notion of the good and and the beautiful in the ancients. Yeah, please, Richard. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, it's, I have nothing. I have nothing to add. That's yeah. Am I off of my? Yeah, no, you're on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, that, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I have nothing to add to that. I mean, Eloy is no longer here, but I thought he really brought up a very important point. You know, how do you really build a movement with love? And, you know, we read Stieg Lair. How do you build a movement on care, an economy of contribution and a real economy of care? You know, in this kind of, you know, uh, economy of negligence and economy of, uh, you know, complete, uh, complete carelessness that we're living through. I mean, we're really living this live, live time. It's not just a theoretical abstraction or another book. We're living it. It's part of lived experience and every day since during this whole pandemic. And it's interesting. How do you build a, a society on care, love, you know? What do these terms really mean, and what what does it mean beyond mutual aid or beyond uh, you know the old old versions of this? I, I think this these are very important questions uh, going forward, and experimental philosophical as Josh was saying about Badiou's uh, film book. I mean, this is a this again is a thought experiment, right? This book, in many ways, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bruno, yeah. No, no, no. I agree. Yes, yes. I, uh... So the experiment, yeah. Right. The, 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 this one on Plato the, the, by Badiou. That I, I, I hate to say that I increasingly like it. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, I had some resistance. Uh, I mean, I had some differences, you know, some yeah. problems yeah. with it, of course. But yeah, of course. it's an interesting experiment. Uh, yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's the kind of things that you find more in, 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 of course, in literature rather than in philosophy. That's interesting. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, you have yeah. an imaginary dialogue here, mm -hmm. and the whole point is to engage the dialogics of it, right? I mm -hmm. mean, instead of us, you know, really, again, I, I emphasize this, if we can follow the dialogue and pick up on some of the humor and some of the moves, it can be very rewarding in terms of, of thought, I, I think. 
you know, uh, mm -hmm. this is one reason to do it. And even going back to Plato, because I'm, I look at this, you know, he's not so far from the original, you know, in a way. He may, yeah, yeah. he brings it up, but the, the, the original is here. I mean, I have all the passages marked. I mean, it's amazing. Right. You know, they well, talk yeah, about yeah, these, but these are the uh, philosophy. You could, it, it also from the, from the perspective of translation, Yes. You know, and what is translation? Um, yes. it, it's a very, it's, you know, just having these two texts and working between them is, is mm -hmm. very interesting. Right. And, and, and Badiou himself calls this a hyper translation, right? I mean, and uh, a hyper text, he calls hyper it. Text, a hyper text. It's a very interesting notion in the beginning, right? He, he, right, right. he speaks to this in his preface. And he also talks about, um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, yes, he talks about the hypertext, right? Yeah. 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 Hyper translation. So Hyper translation. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. right. No, but it's certainly, in, I mean, at that moment, there are very, like when he you know, mentions, I don't know, Jacques Lacan and now Pirandello, Calderon, and so on. I mean, that's interesting, even by you himself. Although when he should have said Alain, when he mentions himself rather than uh, using his first name rather than last, he would have worked. I better. think uh, you know he could also be using Alain the philosopher. Hey. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know he could also be using the great Simone Biles. Yeah, right, teacher, right. Who yeah, was yeah. A, is again yeah. a forgotten figure in the in the history of uh, philosophy. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. He, he calls it treating the text, right? Mm -hmm. Treating the text. This is on Roman numeral 32 of the introduction, mm -hmm. the preface to the book. Yeah. Treating the text. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. How does one treat the text? Which, again, it's a kind of, you know, physician, you know, some way of looking at things, right? How mm -hmm. do we treat it, right? Yeah, in a sense. Mm -hmm. right? What is the therapeutic, right? Yeah. yeah. He talks about how his, what he was armed, armed with, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, you know the uh, and Adimantus becomes a man. He talks about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a soul in Plato. We have the tripart division of the subject, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of the soul, right? He changed the name. The idea of the good, mm -hmm. the good, the ascendancy, if you will, in the, from the cave up, is the idea of the true, not the idea of the good, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, in the in the Greek, right? And in, in, in a sense, he changed it. Yeah, it's not simply the truth, right? And then he goes in, uh, you know, what's more, the parts of the soul he changes, and this is interesting, Lydia, because this will play out too later. Desire, affect, and thought replace appetitive soul, the spiritual soul, mm -hmm. affect, and then thought is rational. Mm -hmm. So politics is thought. Where the philosopher dwells, etc., is the highest, you know, part of the tripart division of the soul. Mm -hmm. At the bottom, of course, is desire, right? Yeah. And I also like the way he phrases it, this, you know, when he says, I also gave myself permission, permission to translate God as the big other, or even sometimes as right. the other to cool. You know, right. just right. The way right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's kind of cool too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Energy as the big yeah. other. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Good. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that, it's interesting that uh, here, too, the uh, the decisions that he's made. But yeah. yes, the tripart division of the soul is interesting. You have the appetitive, the spiritual, right? The, the place of recognition and where the guardians are supposed to dwell. And then, of course, the rational in Plato. But by you, instead of the appetitive, desire, Mm -hmm. Instead of the spiritual affect, and then thought, in terms of yeah. the rational, right? Yeah. Right, right. So dialectic leads yeah. to thought. Yeah. yeah. Dialectic, you know, and, and this is why people. I mean, earlier today, uh, I think uh, both David and uh, Eloy said, you know, Stanley, um, you know, uh, uh, got me over my fear of uh, of uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. What what basically was happening was that they were began to think. You know, they began to dialecticize. This is what was really going on. There was mm -hmm. a different kind of synthetic activity. There was dialectical that really started in terms of process. 
yeah. this is interesting you know how how people change how they're transformed what happens in in terms of a economy. Uh, yeah yeah so i think this is also interesting too dialectic as verb dialecticizing right as a as a as a as a, as a part of simple right yeah yeah, in any way. Right? Okay. So, no, I, I'm going now, but so next time, yeah, no, no, the, no, 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 chapter, next chapter 11, what is, what is an idea next time? Yeah, next week, we, I want to do both what is an idea and, and as much as we can of the cave, we can read. I put it up on the website. Okay. It's under so, uh, notes to the class, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on the website, you know, the, the, the go through yeah. the, the Zoom mm -hmm. thing. And uh, yes, yeah, so I want to go on to what is an idea? And, and uh, also the chapters six and seven of the Republic itself, mm -hmm. and Badiou's chapters 12 and 13, right? Oh, so 11, 12, and 13, or 11, oh, no, 11 and 12, I'm 12, sorry. 11 and 12. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. From uh, mathematics to that. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to look at a dialectical uh, process, is mm -hmm. what he's really hopefully talking yeah. about in terms of this ideal, right, if you will, and then how does it become the material real? You know, when we talk about material, the materiality is also in mathematics, right? I mean, we have yeah, yeah. nothing but, you know, and then the materiality, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. We can talk about material conditions, but materialism itself, right, is another story. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, okay. see you next time. Thank yeah, you. Okay, good. I guess yeah. people are hungry. Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, me too. I'm going to call okay. you. Is it a good time to call you on Friday morning? Would be okay, or okay. yeah, Are you busy. Yeah, oh, okay. Right. Okay. yeah. I wanted to catch up a little bit. Thank you, Lydia, too. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah. I'll, I'll call you. I'll call you Friday. I wanted to run a couple of things uh, by you too. Okay, yeah. great. See how you're doing. 